We're going to call the meeting to order at 6.05. Um, and the first uh, order on the agenda is the approval of minutes from September 21st, 2020. Um, my assumption is that most of you did not get that until just now. So we're going to let everybody pause for a second so the board members can review the minutes um, and check in in three minutes, maybe. I'm going to try to put them up on the screen. Oh, perfect. Can everybody see that? Yes. Nikki, people are handing in uh, uh, their uh, recommendations for membership on the anti-racism task force. Uh, to, or is that a question or a statement? That was a that was a question. I just saw it in the minutes. Oh, I know. Um, Stephen and I are going to touch base about that. Okay. Who took those minutes? Beth did. She did Beth. an awesome job. Yeah, they're good. That's what I like. Again. Yeah. Short good. and sweet. Good and concise. Okay, so Scott's back. I think I see we're still missing Colleen, but I see everybody else. Um does anybody know anything about Colleen? Should I text her? I don't. Probably worth. Probably I worth it. To, talked to her this or this afternoon at pickup, and she was good to go. She talked about coming to the meeting. Said she'd see okay. me, so she should be on her way. I would assume. Okay. I'll just say checking. Just checking in. Yep. Okay. Um. Okay. So, do I have a motion to approve the minutes? So moved. Okay, that was Scott moved. I'll second. Sarah second. Sorry, I did that by voice. That was you, right, Sarah? Pauline oh, <laughs> okay. just emailed. She can't get into the meeting. Well, I'm just send, I'll send well, her the link. Then. Let me send her the link. Uh, yeah, that'd be great, David. I'll do that. Awesome. I think she's had this trouble. Before. Thank you for seeing that. <clears throat> Okay, um, is there any discussion on the minutes? Looked good. Yeah, Beth, those were awesome minutes. They were like so concise and captured everything. It, yeah. Thank awesome. you, Beth. You're welcome. Okay, so, so um, no further discussion. All those in favor of approving the minutes of September 21st, 2020, please say aye. 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 And a hand raised from Beth. Okay, all those opposed? Extensions? No. Okay, so approved. Um, I wanted to revisit um, because the minutes are good at reminding us of things that were still on the table. Um, one of the things that I do not have a further update on is the Thetford Academy tuition. Um, Ed has done a whole bunch of emailing. Um, 
and has also not heard anything. And so Ed and I are both under the impression of no news is good news. Um, nobody has come back and said that it's not appropriate. Um, so we, I guess, still wait, but um, hearing nothing further in the discussion, I think that's it's probably fine. Um, so we'll we'll keep waiting. Um, and if I hear anything, I'll let you guys know. But I don't know. Anything. What's, the, what's the question we're waiting for? Um, so. The state auditor um, flagged, so at the state level, not the DOE level, um, flagged the Thetford tuition um, as an issue, paying the full tuition, um, saying that they were not um, a public school and that we were not supposed to be paying the full tuition to them. Um, but then DOE, Ed went to DOE and said, we've always been paying the full tuition figure this out. Um, so DOE went back and forth with Ed from my understanding and um, they went back to the state and we haven't heard anything further. Mm. So my hope is that it's resolved. Katie. I know I talked to them the other day cause we still haven't received their contracts either for, okay. and that they told us they were still waiting to hear whatever they were waiting to hear about that they were oh. not sending out any contracts yet. So oh, Thetford. that was Thetford. Yeah. Huh. So, and I don't, they, they didn't elaborate on it, but we still haven't seen anything from them either from our end in, in special ed. Well, that's insightful because I thought it was just us that got flagged for paying full tuition to them. It sounds like maybe they got flagged by the state entirely. Um, I'm not sure. Um, yeah. They mentioned yeah, no, it sounds like we're in the dark. Yeah. So, um, but we, we've been cricket since because we were waiting for that too. That's an outlier for us. So. Yeah. Okay, lots of crickets. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Katie. That was really helpful. Yeah. Um, there's something else I saw in the notes that I wanted to discuss, but I can't. The anti racism task force I mentioned. Yeah. I think, well, that's not on our agenda. Okay. Something else that I saw, there were two things, and I can't find it now. Oh, I just wanted to say, um, that's what it was. Um, I went to, uh, Alyssa joined us at our last meeting um, to talk about uh, what her virtual classroom looked like and to get approval for a Black Lives Matter and LGBTQ flag. Um, and my daughter went to her um, classroom today and it is beautifully done. Um, and I was just so impressed. And my daughter was so excited because it was so beautifully done. She was excited to be in it and she was excited to show it me in it. So um, I just thought that any board members who hadn't had a chance to see that um, should know that it was incredibly well done and it is a very welcoming classroom and it was kind of exciting to see. So I was glad that she came to us and I was also glad to see the results. Both, okay. both my kids were doing their after school work, um, listening to meditation music and watching Bob Ross videos from there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I had to cut off the Bob Ross video so that we could focus on some other things. <laughs> but there's also a, uh, oh, I forget what it's called. Um, it's a, there's a coloring, there are coloring books, digital coloring books that you can do. And I had to also say, okay, we're moving on from here too. <laughs> so it was, uh, there's lots of meditation oriented activities, uh, which is fantastic. Okay, so um, we have uh, public participation. Is there anybody that wants to speak up at this point about any issue? Um, I know that we've got Kara on the line and some of her issues are gonna come up during the COVID, COVID update. Um, is there any other public? Okay, I'm not hearing anything. Um, okay, and then uh, as far as the agenda goes, we have the principal's report, superintendent's report, COVID update, um, the, a budget update from Ed, portrait of a graduate, and anti-racism task force. Um, I think we should move, should we move superintendent and principals or should we keep those up top? We can move those, we can move those down, I think, and uh... And Ed asked to go a little bit more toward the top of the agenda, but that, you know, we That's, can, we might want to, cause Kara's on the line too. I don't know how long she's got, but if you want to do the COVID. Yeah. That's what I was thinking. If we could move COVID one and budget two. 
Yeah. And then that, reassess. That okay. All right. So that, what did I miss? No, uh, you won't. missed us approving the minutes. That's it. okay. And You're gossiping good. about you. <laughs> well, yeah, that's good. <laughs> you don't want me there for that. So <laughs> you, you missed the conversation of should I text Colleen? <laughs> So, we're good. Couldn't get okay. in. Something my computer just, I don't know, balked. They're not happy. Um, I, by the way, I don't know if you guys can tell on the screen, I got a new computer and I no longer have buzzing coming out of the speakers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome. And it's a beautiful big screen. So it's kind of fun. Mm -hmm. uh, bigger screen, I should, I should say. Okay, so let's move on to the COVID update. Um, David, you want to take it away? Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll start, but then I'll let I'll let Christine talk a little bit more locally, and and Angie uh, can also add anything that I, uh, I, I you know, that I that, that I leave out. I just want to remind everybody that essentially we we're keeping you know three three environments going or three schools going that are all very different. You know, one is the K eight uh, school, which is basically um, uh, three of our four of our buildings actually all are involved in that and that's the uh, that's the hybrid model where we're um, we're we're uh, in person in the morning and then in the afternoon uh, the, the, the students leave and it did take us several weeks to certainly to, to figure out the afternoons I'm still not so sure we've got it completely figured out because there were a bunch of moving pieces to all of that including and mostly around, uh, how to group kids, uh, how to provide support services, um, how to do interventions. Uh, um, that, that, that was always a, you know, and I know Katie Ahern, who's on the line too, she could certainly add to this at some point, but that's been, there's a lot of moving pieces in that too, in terms of uh, how special educators are, are, uh, are reaching out to kids, how support staff and paraprofessionals are, are reaching out to kids. But I think the way that the morning is organized, uh, and I know there is some question, I think that's part of what Kara's going to talk about tonight about, you know, whether or not the day can be extended. And we can talk about that, you know, in, in a little while. But I think the way we did reopen, uh, as I walk around the buildings and go in and out of the classrooms, um, I think that the K-8 model, uh, uh, definitely the, the, the morning part of the K-8 model, is still working well. Teachers have been incredibly cooperative. Parents have been incredibly cooperative. The health checks are going in, in, incredibly well. The pods, the pod structure, uh, getting kids organized around uh, a, a little bit more of an integrated curriculum, getting kids outside. Uh, and I think probably just in general, the, the peace and order of the environment because the kids are in pods and there's a lot less transitioning. I mean, I think I heard Brittany say the other day that behavior mm -hmm. reports and Discipline referrals are down anywhere from 70 to 80 percent. So it's just 71 a 71 to be exact. 71 percent to be wow. exact. It's just a it's a it's an incredibly and I I've seen it. Seems it's an incredibly strange. peaceful environment. So that's one school we've got going. The K8. Then the other piece is the high school. You don't get too involved in that at Artland, but I will tell you that uh, that's that's going pretty well. The kids come in and get three classes in the morning. Uh, including an, uh, uh, an integrated uh, uh, unit. They st all start together in the morning and, and they are clustered in pods. They work together and then they go to two other classes, but those classes are within those pods. So those kids are not moving around the building either. And I know that the, the you know, the two new administrators, Colleen and Kate, have been working very hard to make that work well. And I know Angie's been a great resource uh, for them as well. So, uh, and that too, not just the K-8 piece at, at, at Windsor, but also the uh, the high school piece at Windsor. Very, uh, you know, very peaceful, very orderly. Kids have been outside a lot, uh, in, involved in the integrated work, and and also they go they they leave around they leave at 11. Some kids go to the tech center. Most of the kids go home, and then they engage in three additional blocks of instruction. And then Angie uh, has been coordinating. The third school, basically, and that's the totally 100% remote school, and that's got uh, several of our SU teachers engaged with kids from across the SU, uh, and, and Angie, I don't know whether you want to speak to how that's going directly or not, but 
I get the sense that there were glitches in the beginning, but most of those have gotten worked out. I, I've sat in on a few of those classes because uh, I don't want to lose touch with those remote kids. And uh, I think amazing work is being done by the staff that Angie's supervising. Uh, did you want to talk about that at all, Angie? Yeah, I will. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so um, it is. Uh, it was not without a very steep learning curve, continues to be a steep learning curve for some of our families. Um, we're just getting down to data regarding student progress and working on that in our staff meeting tomorrow um, so that I can have some solid numbers. Um, as expected, um, the families that um, had some tech savvy um, are able to make it work. And those that have struggled with that, struggled with their, um, with their internet connection um, has, in, <sighs> Some of the students have really struggled. So it is, it's like a, a little tiny version of the school, though there is, a, you know, a fair number that are, are being very successful and then a number that I'm concerned about and how we support those families is really on my mind right now, how we support them and offer them the same kinds of supports that we offer our in-person students. And part of that is access is just not the same. So um, we're working on that. That's the, no. the, the biggest challenge, I'd say, with it. Yeah. I, I just to cl closing out, uh, I, I do want to give a shout out again to our school nurses. I think they've done a phenomenal job trying to stay on top of this. They are the ones that have to make decisions about who quarantines, who doesn't quarantine, when they can come back, who has to test, who doesn't have to test. They've got the algorithm from the VDH. They've been using it, I think, quite uh, efficiently and effectively. Uh, you know, we've had a couple of situations where, you know, the parents didn't feel like the kids needed to stay home because it was just a runny nose or a, or a, or a temporary fever. But um, we're standing behind the fact that those nurses are the COVID coordinators in our building and we're supporting them. If they say they have to stay home, they have to stay home. If they say they have to get a COVID test to return, then they have to get a COVID test to return. I'm just not going to take that liability and responsibility for the health care for the healthcare, uh, uh, you know, uh, industry. So again, a shout out to them and a shout out to the administrators who are trying to make this work. I will say that we, are, and, and this may be pertinent to, uh, uh, and I don't know exactly the questions that Kara have. I, I've certainly I've read her her written questions, but um, I know that there are questions about, you know, whether this model, you know, is is going to change or how long is it going to be in effect. I will tell you that the administrative team is talking about that right now. Uh, we're waiting for some further guidance from the Agency of Education. Uh, we, are, we have been promised this week, if not by the end of this week, certainly early next week, that we're going to get that guidance. I think there is some concern at the, uh, at the level of the Agency of Education and, quite frankly, the Vermont Department of Health about whether or not we have to make adjustments based on uh, Holiday travel and that period of time between Thanksgiving and 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 uh, and the Christmas season or the holiday season, uh, and they they have promised us guidance around that. Uh, I, I think that uh, that whether or not it's it's whether or not there'll be any extended remote time, we we've decided certainly as an administrative team, and we would have involved the board if we thought differently that we're not going to recommend any additional remote time unless the state recommends additional remote time. We would have had to go to the SU board with that anyway. Uh, so that's that's just the way, you know, it, it's it's going to unfold here. We published our calendar. We're going to stay with our, with our calendar. But there are rumors circulating at the AOE level that the governor's office and the AOE may be making some announcements about, uh, I don't know whether they're going to mandate additional time or whether they're going to encourage it or whether they're going to just ignore it like like uh, like we have uh, as well. In terms of extending the day, we're gonna we're gonna get the we had a reopening task force that worked diligently to come up with schedules and time frames. Uh, there were certainly members of the union on that task force because you know many of these alternative schedules require compliance with our master agreement and with our contract uh, because you know uh, both support staff and teachers are. Uh, are, are, are tied to certain uh, 
you know, parts of that contract that require, uh, you know, duty-free lunches, for example, certain dismissal times, uh, planning periods. So we're going to reconvene that reopening task force, depending on the information we get from the state. And we're going to look at um, what we could do about extending uh, the day um, any further. I mean, the general consensus is that the high school seems to be working because there are three, um, there are three in-person classes and three remote classes, but the K-8 uh, hybrid model, it seems like we're, we are struggling with getting access to certain kids who, as Angie said, struggle with the technology, struggle with the platform. Um, so if there was a way to, and by the way, uh, uh, all of our kids don't go to good learning spaces when they leave our buildings. Some of them go to their child care centers, some of them go to the rec centers, some of them go to relatives or grandparents' houses. Uh, some have good Wi-Fi access. Some don't have good Wi-Fi access. So, so that's that's a problem. So I think there is there is the thought afoot that if the state you know doesn't come out come out with some decree about uh, uh, needing to uh, to extend remote or, or or be more remote, that I think there's a there's a there's a feeling among the administrative team that we'd like to maybe start to extend. Uh, that day. But what we don't want to do is disrupt that pod structure. And we don't want to disrupt, um, you know, the restrictions that we've got in place around masking and distancing and, <clears throat> and hand washing and all the things that seem to be working and creating a peaceful climate for our kids and for and for our staff. So we just have to be careful if and when we decide to extend that day as to how we do that and, and consider all of those factors uh, you know, that, that branch out into support services, unified arts teachers, schedules, uh, the master agreement. So it's, it's not just, it's not just like waving a wand and making it happen. It's, it's going to take some real, uh, planning and, and that planning is, is pro starting probably as early as this week. We, we've talked, we're getting together with the union on, on Friday. <clears throat> some of this will be an initial discussion and then we'll see where we go, uh, from there. But um, it's a difficult environment. It's a hard environment. Uh, it's a scary environment for some. I think the thing we have to remember is that we do have adults in our community, staff members in our community that still have anxiety about all of this. They, they live with immune compromised relatives or parents. Uh, they have children that have compromised systems. And, and so it's always a delicate balance about how to move uh, move forward. So that's kind of where we are. And Christine, I don't know if you wanted from a Heartland perspective to talk about how it's going, and, and then we can certainly open it to any questions. Yeah, David, I think you covered a lot of it. But um, the first um, thing on my list was to really thank Annette, our school nurse. She's doing an amazing job. It's a hard job because people, um, it, you know, especially with the change in um, uh, neighboring communities going to yellow travel restrictions. It's very complicated for people. And so she's doing a really great job um, letting people know the expectations and the rules. And sometimes it's, um, it's, it's hard to hear that information. So she's doing a really great job. So kudos to her. Um, I think our, our, you know, the system that we have in place is working really well. The health checks are, are going really well um you know with the temperatures cooling off the thermometers are still an issue at some point um sometimes so we are now holding them under our armpits to keep them warm so that they are more accurately refre reflecting kids temperatures but um i think we're still the afternoon schedule is um getting ironed out i think it's it's a it's a work in progress uh and and Brittany and i have really been um, that's one of the big items on our, our list, making sure the kids that need support in the afternoon and are available for that support are, are getting it. So um, working on that, Canvas seems to be coming along. Uh, teachers are getting used to it and kids are, kids are getting used to it as well. Um, I think I, I will say in terms of extending the day, I've mentioned it to a couple of teachers and they, they are in favor of it. So um, I think, you know, we, we should, we should definitely start talking about that. Um, they are, there are some 
staff that are, you know, the weather's getting cold and they're still going outside. Doors are still open. The heat's on. That's the best we can do. I mean, we need, we need fresh air to be in the classrooms. Um, but I will say, uh, and I'll share in my presentation later and the survey results, we surveyed the teachers, um, I think last week, mm -hmm. uh, last Friday or two Fridays ago. And I think their biggest concern is travel over the holidays and coming back to school. Um, they are very concerned and recognize that people need to see their families. They haven't seen them and it's stressful not seeing family. So it's just a concern. Um, so otherwise I think we're, we're doing pretty well. Um, there's great teaming going on, great collaboration. People are stepping up when staff members are out, other members are filling in and um, the, ki the kids are doing a phenomenal job. I can't, I can't say that enough. They really are very impressed with, with how they're doing. So if you have specific questions, just let me know. Awesome. So I, we do have a question. Um, oh, Beth, go ahead. Did you have a No, I mean, just uh, what I've what I've seen and I guess the one concerning thing I've heard and seen is the lack of of intervention happening. You know, both my kids were receiving some sort of intervention um, mm -hmm. and that hasn't happened yet this year. And so that's that's where I I'm a little concerned for my own kids. But then I know <clears throat> that you know what I, I understand the teachers are supposed to be doing it after and then of course my kids are going to the rec for most of the week and so it's it's really the reality of that is really high for our family and i know i've talked to other families that are really concerned around um that as well and um yeah and i don't know if you know <clears throat> the wi-fi at the rec isn't great you know both my kids could potentially do it you know it's that whole thing of like how can we um accommodate it a little better but it's it's um yeah, and I know other my. It's not just me. I know there's other folks that have talked to me about that that situation as well. Um, yeah. And how I, how is the rec trying to handle it? Are they the rec has been doing? I mean, it? they have tw they have twenty kids as far as I can tell, <laughs> and they're outside like ninety nine points of the time, and they they've they're running it basically like they ran their summer camps. Um, so they do temperature checks when they get off the bus there and everything, and they're just out and doing it um, as much, you know, outside as possible. My hope is that they maybe can, I mean, I don't know if you've talked to the rec, Christine, but be able to move over to the the gym for the winter, you know, like that it would be so much more space than a tiny little rec basement. <laughs> I was just wondering how they were trying to handle the online school after school, if they were making an effort to get kids sure. signed on and doing stuff. It's it's it, what I've witnessed is it's kid it's more kid directed, okay. and so they've you know like like Samara will do will ask to do her work and she can go upstairs. There's that like workout room, and so she can go they can go up there and do that or have a meeting um, there. They get some Wi-Fi outside, um, but it's mostly student directed. It's not. Um, I, I mean, I think they might ask, "Do you want to do your work?" But they're not like sitting down and corralling kids or anything like that. Um, That's yeah, yeah. They, don't, they don't have someone doing that. Um, yeah, yeah. Intervention, intervention is one of our concerns as well, um, which is why Brittany and I are looking carefully at, at schedules in the afternoon and seeing staff that are available. Um, kids just took finished the TM, well, they're not quite done with TMP testing, all of them, but that's useful data that we need for um, to plan for intervention. But our interventionists, you know, they're classroom teachers this year, so we don't have an available um, specific intervention um, teachers, so it's it has to be the classroom teachers. Yeah. So, so, it, so, it, so I think that's what's been motivating the conversation at the administrative yeah. team level around extending the day uh, by master agreement. You know, we we need to provide teachers with a duty free lunch and with a planning period, which which results in about an hour and a half of time uh, that be, because we've got them in pods. And we and the teachers are not moving around, and they're not getting a, a substantial break in the morning. Uh, so, but there is some talk about whether or not we would extend the day uh, to, let's say, one fifteen or one thirty, and then, and then when we're done, we're done. And, and then they would get their duty free lunch, and they would get their planning period at the end of the day. But we would be able to do all of this instruction and all of this intervention and all of this resource work and. Uh, and and uh, the uh, services for IEP students, 
we would be able to do all of that on site. And and because it is hard when you got kids going to the rec center, or you got kids going to grandma's house or to this to this child care. So the idea is uh, if we can get the staff and the union, and I think I don't I, like Christine said, I'm optimistic because I think they recognize the problem and I think they'd like an extended day. Uh, so I, I, I think we're going to get there. It's just it's logistically going to take us a little time to get there. And then, you know, we don't we you know, we want to make sure, too, that we don't get, you know, kind of antithetical information from the AOE saying, OK, let's bottle up tighter now. Winter's coming. The flu season's here. You know, let's you know, I, I don't I don't think we'll get that because Vermont still appears pretty green on the map. But I'm looking around this country as a whole and seeing how many cases per day. And it's not very heading into holiday season. It, it's not very optimistic, if you know what I mean. But but I don't know, maybe we just ignore that and let the state worry about that. And we just keep going with what 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 we want to do. I think that's but I would um, I, I agree with you, David, that the the national picture doesn't look optimistic. And I think Windsor County right now is orange, yeah. um, which is also not good. Yeah. Um, but uh, I do, I see value in trying to figure out how to extend the day, even if it doesn't happen until March. Mm -hmm. um, I think that that planning takes time and it takes work. And while I'd love to, <laughs> one of my kids was crying, why can't we do it all in school? Um, today. So while I think it would be awesome um, to be able to accomplish it all in school, I don't know if that's going to happen in the short term, but I think it's worthwhile to have that planning because I, yeah. I think that when it gets warm again and flu season is passed, we're still going to be looking at this question. So um, yeah. I think that that would be good. And I think, um, Nikki, Nikki, to be honest, I think if, if everything goes well, I think we could do it well before March, but we'll keep everybody posted. I did want to make one other statement and, and, and then I, I saw Sarah, your hand went up, but um, <clears throat> we, you know, we have had this year, two active cases of, of, of COVID two two folks who have tested positive, one in the very beginning who really had very little interaction. It was neither one of these are Heartland uh, staff members. Uh, and a matter of fact, just tested again and tested positive again. This person has worked maybe one day or two days. It's a brand new support staff member and and uh, and and they and, and there's really struggling uh, when, when you get hit hard with this COVID-19, it is not a pretty sight. I just want to remind everybody on 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 this call that COVID-19 is a dangerous it's a dangerous infection and it, it it hits people differently. And I think, unfortunately, the message we're getting from from the, you know, from from the from the top, you know, national seen is is, is a, the, the messages are mixed but the people that i've known that have contracted this disease uh or, or this infection it, it's it's been brutal but i will say that what what we've decided to do and this came off of certainly sarah an email you sent to me i think we've been we've been and when we have a positive covid19 case we've been announcing it to the district that's involved but there was some thought that we should widen that and that if we have a, po a positive COVID-19 case, whether it be a staff member or a student, that we should probably announce it SU-wide. So everybody knows and can follow kind of the, not only the supervisory union, but we're contributing to some degree to, to, to that Windsor County that, that, you know, that's growing. I know of at least two other people, they don't work in our district, but who right now have tested positive for COVID-19. So it's in Windsor County. It's, it, it's not, you know, I mean, it's all I'm glad relative. you mentioned that, David, because it's that was something that I wanted to ask about. I think it's really important for us to communicate out as much as we can. Any information anybody has helps other people. Right, deal with it. Right. Yeah, act on on what's happening. Right. Um, and I I think that the numbers are starting to go up, and that we. Um, we can't anticipate what's going to happen next, but I'm hearing through grapevines in the medical field that we have more community spread than we did in the springtime, which is, you know, different from people coming in from out of town and that, you know, buckle up, buckle up. Yeah, that's a good point. Yep. Is all. Okay. So I saw a lot of hands raised and I want to. Yes. Brittany, I'm sorry. You... I didn't mean to jump in. No, that's okay. Brittany, you had something a while ago. 
Oh, I was just going to say, I don't know how many kids we have at the Windsor camp because I know it's opened up some of our camp kids, but I know that they are providing um, a certain time block per group. It sounds like they're divided into groups. So each group gets a time block for academic time. So um, it's, it seemed promising. I don't know if we have kids there, but um, that's all. Beth, I saw you and Sarah, I think. I was either Beth or Scott. You guys were in the same... I think Beth went already. No, Sarah okay. might have been next. Sarah. Um, so I was going to ask a question, but just before I say that, David, because you brought up the the notification policy, um, I think I think that's great, and I, I I just really think it's important that we have a, you know, sort of a routine when we get a positive case that there's a press release that goes out, there's a notification that goes out to every SU family. Um, this is what every other school district in the area is doing. Um, and that we just, you know, it's like a, like clearly I've been getting the, the Hanover ones and, you know, even as a high school parent, I get them when there's an elementary case, I get them when there's a middle school case. And it's really just a, it's almost like a form letter that says, you know, we have been notified of a case. It doesn't reveal any information about whether it's a student or a staff member. Um, we are following, you know, just lists everything that's being done to contact trace and telling people what to expect. And I just think it has to be that kind of a, an automatic um, release when we have a positive case within our SU so that people trust that they're hearing about it. <laughs> you know, I think, I, I just think that's really important. So I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And I think, I mean, we, I don't know if we need to talk about an official policy or, um, you know. Um, and then my other question that I wanted to ask about the half days was, I know part of the rationale for, for doing the afternoons of distance learning was to sort of a, give everyone a chance to practice so that we'll be ready in case we have to go 100% remote. And so I just wanted to ask how, sort of how that part of it is going. Um, you know, I have a I, I have a little bit of a sense from my own house that it you know there there was definitely kind of a learning curve, but it does feel like the kids have kind of settled into, okay, we get home, we sit down, this is what we do, this is where I go. From your perspective, um, how how is that working? Do you feel like it's preparing us for that eventuality? Do you want me to go, David? Yeah, Christine, I think it'd be good for yeah, you. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I think it is, um, I think the staff and the students are figuring it out. Um, it's different by pod. I will say we were meeting with K1 today, um, Brittany and I, to kind of flush out afternoon uh, schedules and what that looks like and the supports that are there and which kids need that. And, you know, they're, they're getting there, it's not, you know, they're waiting for parent-teacher conferences to, to really connect with parents, to share um, w what the needs are and the availability of kids and parents, because at that level, you really need a parent with you um, <laughs> to, to, to do the work. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, two, three, four is more settled. Actually, fourth grade started early and, and piloted some stuff, and I think they, they've, they're in, the, in sync and, and doing pretty well. Um, a five, six, I mean, fifth seems to be on track. Sixth grade is, um, it's, it's when canvas comes into play and the curriculum is, is, it's pretty, uh, what's the, what's the word I want to say? It's a lot of reading text and responding. It's not that exciting. It's, um, I don't think it's all that we hoped it would be. So we're trying to figure that out. Um, uh, Angie can <laughs> concur or or not. <laughs> I think she'd concur. And then seven eight, they really set up a nice system of um, kids. They're they're really using it as win time. What I need time. Um, it, it was fit time last year. Um, focused instruction time, and they're allowing the kids to sign up on Monday for what they think they need help in for that week. And then they're going to the um, the meetings that they need to go to, and the teachers are are doing more double dosing of instruction or helping kids individually. So it's a work in progress. I think, will it mirror what what it looks like when we go remote completely? I mean, I believe that's on our admin agenda for <laughs> Wednesday, making sure we have all our ducks in a row um, 
and that staff knows the expectations and families know the expectations and what's, what that's going to look like. But um, I don't know, uh, David, Angie, is that? That's helpful. Yeah, that's helpful. That is that helpful? Okay. It sounds like Kara might want to ask um, an additional question that it's that she felt like it sounds like that we that we haven't uh, responded to yet. Did you, Kara? Did you want to unmute? Yeah, I'm just Kara, reading. why don't you go ahead and ask your question? I think I've asked a lot of questions that I haven't heard answers to. Um, yeah, so um, some of the questions are appropriate for public meeting, and other questions are less appropriate for public meeting. Um, and so I was going to ask uh, the questions out of your email um, to the group. Um, so uh, one of the one of Kara's questions was um, transparency as far as um, the supervisory union teacher expectations, um, what school employees are supposed to be doing um, during those uh, in-person hours. So between the 1230 dismissal and three o'clock. I don't know if Christine or David wants that. Make sure. Yeah. So we're talking about the in-person block. Or the, the, no, the the when the kids are remote, what are the um, okay, yeah, staff supposed to be doing? Yeah, so so that's uh, that's exactly what I said. They are entitled to a a half an hour duty free lunch and a and a forty five minute planning period. So for an hour and a half, they had to do nothing basically except plan. And Sorry, Dr. Baker, could you just could you explain what time um, the teacher contract starts in the morning? Because I know now that kids are not. Um, starting school until 8.30. I know that teachers are no longer showing up as early as they used to. So that kind of affects the, the work day schedule. And additionally, is there anything in the contract about um, being allowed to provide childcare to their own children during the paid work day? Um, uh, so I, I, I can answer the contract time. The contract hours are 7.45. Start at 7.45. Staff are expected to be at work at 7.45. Uh, health checks start at 8. So kids are going into the classrooms at 8 o'clock in the morning and supervised by teachers during the 8 to 8.20 time. Um, kids are able to eat breakfast. Teachers are checking in with them. Um, and they typically start around... Um, 8.30 is the official time. Once everybody's in and settled, they have morning meeting time, but they are on site at 7.45 and, and kids are arriving at eight. Yeah, and that's always that's always been the case. That's been the arrival time at, at Heartland, 7.45. So nothing's changed there. I'll answer the second part. There is nothing in the contract that allows for for, for, for us to, uh, to, to enable them to do childcare uh, from a management perspective. We've just decided in the afternoon that if they can uh, work remotely from home and they do have child care issues, then we've allowed them to do that. I mean, that's just, it's just consistent with kind of our philosophy to support families where we can support families. So that's, that's, it's, that's not obligated in the contract. It's just the way we've been treating our staff. And I, I totally respect that. Um, my only question is, is that like publicly, you know, there are a lot, a lot of working parents in the school district. And I know the board is made up of a lot of people who have some flexibility in their working hours and they have the ability to support their kids and provide the direct instruction. And I just, I, I just wonder if, um, if these decisions, uh, you know, is, is the board, are the people on this team really in touch with the reality of of working parents who don't enjoy such flexibility in their lives and don't enjoy that socioeconomic um, status and I, I get it I mean I, I think that's I think that's great that teachers in your district are supported that way but it really worries me that decisions are being made and the tone of decisions being made seem to really disregard the reality that um, the rest of us are experiencing. You know, I, I appreciate that, Kara. It's one of the reasons that we're considering extending the day, right? There was always a time when students had to leave. Usually it was around 
two thirty. A lot of people work till five, five thirty. So there always had to be some plans made in the afternoon. It's just how long can we keep the kids, you know? And that was that was our original concern was just how long can kids stay masked and stay distanced and stay in pods and so that's why we started off the way we started off but i think just because of what just what you said is why we're considering extent well that's not the only reason but that's one of the reasons we're thinking about extending the day because we know the pressure that it puts on 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 working parents but you know it's 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 a difficulty without a doubt i mean schools have provided historically a child care function uh, right and in in addition to that when when you are providing your staff with the opportunity to not have to spend money on child care and you're telling the community that they are responsible for supporting the education of their child and paying for child care while your employees are enjo enjoying the opportunity to uh, suffer neither of those consequences, I, it really makes me wonder as a taxpayer, you know, it, it makes me feel like, geez, I, I feel like next time it's time to vote for a school uh, budget um, in this town. I would really like to see a cut in the school budget and an increase in a program like the rec department that can actually support the needs of kids in this community um, and perhaps support financially all the families who are paying out a great deal of money in childcare right now that your teachers do not and your staff do not have to experience. Yeah. I, like the optics of that, like that, that makes me a little queasy in the stomach thinking about that. And, and what are other school districts doing? I can tell you that they're not doing that. So what, what entitles one school district to experience those luxuries and and employees in another district not to. Yeah, well, I know Carrie, your district is not is not supporting that. I will tell you, there are other districts that are supporting families and and childcare, and I can't explain why yours doesn't do that. I mean, I get it. I mean, that, that's a decision. I, I'm I'm not I'm talking as a taxpayer in this district. Right. I I, I don't want to talk about anything about anything personal that doesn't have to do with me being a resident of this town. No, what I'm saying and, is- And I, I would love to hear from you, Dr. Baker, some specific examples because all the surrounding communities are not doing this. And, and the surrounding communities are making choices that are best for children and they're learning and, and trying okay. to get kids in school as much as possible and it feels okay. like so, some um, of these decisions are about what's best for yeah that that's teachers. incorrect Tara. that's just incorrect but that's okay Can yeah I, I would i would also agree in that i think that what we are doing is better than all the surrounding schools and that we have our kids in school five days a week and the surrounding schools are going two days a week and that makes it more challenging for teachers and that teachers are out of their houses for more of the time but our kids are in the building five days a week and that's three less days a week that people have to find care. And I, I feel like as a taxpayer and as a board member, I am fully in support of that decision and think that we're in talking to other parents who are also working parents all around, they are jealous of what we have in our SU. And so that's where I stand on that, Sarah. Well, Lebanon's going back to five days a week. Okay, Kara, we have to let the board members talk. Um, I was just gonna, I was just gonna say that you know, as far I haven't heard any um, any issues with staff members, ha you know, having kids while they're uh, in in the afternoon. If there is an issue like that, I think that you know there are appropriate places to address that. Um, but I haven't, I haven't seen any negative effects from this, and I, you know, I, I, I would also just support the idea that, um, you know, I think there are employers all over the Upper Valley right now who are trying to make things a little easier on working families during this time, and I'm, I'm proud to work for or to represent a district that um, is trying to make things a little bit easier. But certainly, if there's a specific instance where a teacher is distracted or isn't, you know, then 
that that can be addressed through our through the policies that we have in place. And I would absolutely support doing that. Um, I also I, think I, that sorry, not I all say, teachers are taking advantage of being allowed to have their kids. There are a lot of teachers whose kids are at home alone, just like a lot of other parents, because those families have decided that the adult can focus better at work. So, um, so maybe I'm totally off base. Maybe I shouldn't have brought it up. You know, I, I love teachers. I, I want, I'm just, my only point is like the optics of it. When, when we're getting emails from Dr. Baker talking about all the expectations for parents and you're going to, you know, crack down this year about expectations and, and hearing those things and then seeing that the folks working in the district aren't feeling those same things that, you know, I like, I, I feel like this is going the wrong way. COVID is serious. COVID is a big deal. Like I, like this isn't a, a political thing. This is just like this, this feels yucky being told over and over about our accountability as parents when the folks who are telling us that aren't feeling the same effects. And, and that's, that's my only point. And, and I don't mean to, that's, that's my only point. So I, I guess I'm done with that. And, and that's it. I, I think I'm the only member of the public who showed up tonight. I'm probably the only member of the public who wrote a letter to you. Um, I, I'm sure it will be quick and easy to dismiss my concerns, but, but my guess is I'm probably not the only one. I'm just the only one stupid enough to bring it up publicly. Karen, you're not the only one that uh, wrote us a letter, although most of the letters um, or phone calls had more to do with trying to extend the day and trying to understand why the day was structured the way it was. Um, we, this is the only concern that we've had as far as teachers. Um, Sarah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say that I, 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 I'm glad Kara brought it to our attention and I think it's a really good conversation to have. And, um, it sounds like the administrative team is, is going in the direction that, um, that I think Kara, you, you would like to see us go in. And I think a lot of, a lot of parents would as well. And there's there's some trickiness here, and it may take more time to get it right and to figure out how to do it, especially if, as seems to be the case, cases are rising over the next couple of weeks. Um, but I you're, you're, I don't think you're alone at all, and I think everyone is. And I'll just say, from the board's perspective, you know, some of us may absolutely enjoy some privileges um, around timing and flexibility. Some of us I know don't. <laughs> um, I'm one of the ones who has a fairly flexible schedule, but I know many of m the other people up here do not have flexible schedules. And I would just say that every single conversation we've had has been around thinking about how tough this is for working families. And we have agonized over it. We really have. Everybody has. And you know, when we were presented with the schedule, we said, "How are people going to do this?" And we, we many times during this discussion, we just keep coming up to, "This is the worst possible solution to this problem, except for every other solution." And we really are just all kind of trying to do the best we can here. But we believe me, we know how hard this is for for all families, for working families, and. and um, you know, we're, we're doing what we can, I guess, is what is what I would say. Yeah. And Kara, I, I totally appreciate you. Oh, sorry. There are a lot of the concerns that you raise are national concerns. I mean, these are the same things that we're facing as a nation in that our the way our country is structured is that school is where we send our kids um, when parents go off to work. And the it, it's a national problem. This isn't something that this board has spent a lot of time talking about it and a lot of time trying to figure it out. And it's going to take a much broader solution than what we can come up with in Heartland. And we've tried and we just and, can't and do it alone. I, I totally appreciate that. I guess one thing I, I wrote um, in, in my comments here is that rather than receiving emails saying how parents are going to be held accountable, um, for achieving learning standards, 
I'd really like this board to support uh, providing parents with a list of learning standards that need to be met during the year and that when we receive uh, assignments that are of low quality, that we don't feel are worthwhile to invest our very valuable time at home, that we have the freedom to choose uh, to meet those le learning standards in a different way on our own um, and not feel like, you know, that that's going to be a problem. I, 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 it, you know, when, when these expectations are suddenly thrust on us at home and what we receive is not of high quality, I, I, as a human being with a brain in my head, am going to choose to opt out and, and choose to educate my children um, as I see fit. And, and I would like to know that this school district and the school board is gonna support me in that and, and not attempt to hold me accountable for checking boxes for them. I can just share my, my Kara, this is Beth. Um, I can just share my own experience regarding that last last spring. Um, you know, I had a similar experience where I wasn't thrilled always with what was coming through the door. Um, I, and I had a conversation with the teacher of, you know, these are the other things I'd like to do. Is that is that appropriate? And the answer was yes. You know, like th there was, it was just good conversations with the teachers that I was able to feel like I got what I needed to move forward and, and feel like I was able to get, you know, the, the, the quality that I was looking for um, with, with, you know, some good conversations with the, with the teachers to move things ahead. And I, and I, I hear I'm, I'm, we are a working family and we do not have a lot of extra time nor cash to be throwing at childcare. Um, and this, I look at all our options and what we're doing and it is all horrible. And there's nothing here that's on my side. And I don't, you know, that's, and that's kind of how it's felt since this whole, whole time. So I, I very much hear what you're saying. And um, it's, 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 it's difficult, but I do have to say, I don't think my family could handle um, like doing AB scheduling or anything like that. Um, the consistency of the five days, even if it's shorter, um, at least I can figure out childcare because that's, you know, it's been, I can't, I can't fathom trying to do on and off days and actually keep a job. Um, so I'm, I'm grateful for that. I don't know if David or Christine, if you guys have a response. Um, like Beth though, I've also found that I have tweaked assignments plenty, both in the spring and this fall. I just had a email with the teacher of what I was proposing and um, in most cases had very positive response. So. Mm -hmm. I don't yeah. know if Christine or David yeah. want to follow me. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm just thinking about what you said, Kara, and the, the piece about parents being held accountable. And um, I, I'm not exactly um, sure what that what that means. I mean, in my mind, parents are our partners right now, and we're, we're working with them hand in hand um, in the afternoons especially and appreciate all that they're doing. So I, I hope that you don't think it's in a, in a punitive way that that's that's kind of what i'm taking away from what what you're saying because we're certainly willing to work with parents and tweak assignments and you know if it's not working for your child that's what we're here for so i, I don't know if that helps or or doesn't help but um that's just what i was thinking about i don't know if david has anything to add about i mean we're, we're struggling with accountability and and it's not that the we're hoping that parents can work with us, but we recognize that parents are working and we're doing the best that we can and, and parents are doing the best that we can. And it, sometimes it's case by case and this parent can't do it and that's okay. So um, we're happy to work with any family uh, around this issue. Yeah, Sorry. I see, <laughs> no, and I see Brittany? Brittany, Brittany's got her hand up too. Yeah, I was just gonna say, I also think that um, because each family is kind of getting used to this new normal at a different rate, um, school certainly started off 
differently. Mm -hmm. um, so dur during the school day, it was a lot of relationship building and getting kids back into school after being off for six months. And, you know, same thing kind of goes for the afternoon. Let's figure out what each family needs. What, what, what can we provide that's reasonable? Let's get some assessment data. Let's figure out where kids are at so that when we do kind of really do a remote push in the afternoon, we're doing it well. And I think that's kind of this little bubble that we've been in this last month of trying to kind of get the hang of all that and get schedules set, um, which, which may feel not fantastic because obviously it's not a full day of school like you, like everybody's typically used to, but, you know, we certainly want to be sure we get it right when we, when we, you know, put it all out there for everybody. So. Um, so I'm, I'm just going through uh, more questions. So the, um, Second question was a what's considered a remote learning day, and I think that the state, did the state, the state had standards for what was considered a remote learning day. We've had one practice remote day, um, and I guess I'm just looking for what they will look like in the future because we've got a lot more coming up. Yeah. Well, our, yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I think our our thinking was that our in-person days would mirror our remote days, and so um, you know that is that is still the hope that we're going to be able to translate what we're doing in school to doing at home as best that we can, and balance um, parents' uh, requests for not as much screen time, and so we're we're trying to figure out how to do that best. Um, but David, feel free to share your thinking on that. No, that was it. I mean, the state, the state has published guidelines and, and they are by, by, you know, grade level, the expectations K4, a five, nine, and then high school a five, eight, and then high school. And they run basically in the average of three, four or five hours, essentially looking at those three grade spans. Um, but they also talk a lot about both that, that, that whole notion of synchronous and asynchronous work, right? So, they're not saying, for example, a middle school student has to be glued to, to, to the screen on a remote day for four to five hours. So it's it's really just setting those expectations. And we, you know, we we you know we we are going to be get because we have these remote days coming up. We're going to be getting a little clearer, and probably it will be important to get that word out to parents too about what the expectation should be around screen time. You know, and and, and non-screen time because that's that that's part of the problem. We've really we always wrestle with how much how much screen time is good for for a student on any particular day. So we've you know, but but there are some guidelines, but they're vague in the sense that they don't tell you how much should be synchronous and how much should be asynchronous. But we're looking at that three to five hour, and as Christine said, we're looking to have it mirror the the uh, the actual school day that we have right now i think um i think that question uh, kara asked that question um and i think um some other parents also asked it and i think it may be because um the first remote day was also a teacher in service day which i think yeah. made it a little bit more challenging so it yeah, um, it was yeah it ended up looking I, it, for us i think it was mostly a fix and finish day with very little actual work yeah. Um, and I guess maybe some reassurance that um, not all remote days are going to look like that. Um, maybe also part of what we need. That That's accurate, Nikki. The staff had two collaborative problem solving sessions to finish up and they were in professional development. And that is part, partly why. Um, and our plan is not to have that happen for for remote days. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. That's what I thought. I just, um, I wanted to make sure that that was clear. Um, so, uh, and then, uh, Kara's last question was related to, um, potentially our guidelines being more strict than state guidelines, but I think David cleared that up in a series of additional emails. Um, does anybody have any further thoughts on that? Um, I feel like this is particularly challenging with, um, Windsor County having a higher caseload than Grafton County, but Grafton County being considered orange. <laughs> so <laughs> that, that makes it a little odd. Um, okay, um, so 
Let's see, I just want to make sure. Uh, does anything? Is there anything else that somebody has to come up? But that that's Ed on the phone. Just Ed Con is, he you know, in terms of the financial report. That that's who's on the phone. I okay. think um, Carol may be the only public. I just just for checking in, um, just for the agenda's sake. Where are we? Because I, I didn't. Uh, we a, are. We are on COVID, which was our first thing, and we haven't gotten any farther. Okay. <laughs> so, um, I'm good. So, and I, uh, for clarity, I did um, have a couple of conversations with people, and I think some other board members did as well. Um, and a, a lot of the conversations were about um, how can we extend this day? It's very challenging um, for working parents, um, and doing the after school part is very challenging for working parents. And I think that, um, I think our administration knows that as well. Um, and I think it was a good way to start and now we're seeing some growing pains. Um, and I think that that was kind of the gist of the conversation that I have with most of the public. Um, okay. So if we've got our, COVID update. Um, let's move on to Ed. Ed, you waited patiently. How's it going? Uh, good, good. Um, I good. sent out a I sent out a financial report earlier uh, this weekend, and with it, I sent out some uh, questions that I had been asked by Sean Wayland in Weathersfield, and I uh, sent them out to give us a basis to have a discussion tonight about. <clears throat> The budget as it stands in FY21 and what, what FY22 looks like. And I hope, did everyone get a chance to look at that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So as you can see from the, the financial report itself, I'm projecting at this point a $253,000 surplus. And it is pretty far out. We're doing a better job of uh, projecting because we're doing a purchase order system, which is still a work in progress but we're, we're getting better at it. Um, so right now we're looking at about a, a, a little less than 3% uh, surplus for the year. Still early, there's still a lot going on, but um, one of the things that's become more obvious to me, and I had this discussion with uh, uh, Christine as well, is that, yes, we do have increases in the uh, costs, due to the pandemic, but we've also realized some savings because things aren't, um, things that we normally would spend money on, we're not spending money on. So I, I did have a conversation with uh, Christine on on um, Friday, and we talked about things like uh, extracurricular transportation, uh, some of the contracted services. What were the other ones, Christine? I, I don't really remember. Uh, travel. Yeah, because people aren't going to workshops, they're taking virtual workshops. We we saw some savings um, in um, supplies because I really told the staff this is not the year to buy anything extra, just the necessities. So we saved a, a decent amount of money there. Um, you know, a transportation basically for we're not transporting. Um, the kids to Windsor for algebra. We're not transporting kids to field trips. So there, there is a cost savings there as well. And then um, the other ones, Ed. I think you've covered them pretty much. I mean, just, yeah. I do think that there's an inordinate amount of conversation around the uh, additional expenditures due to the pandemic. And What's, what's really happened is you've reassigned a lot of people. You've had people that you, you have teachers and, and support staff that you've been able to move around from what I can see. We haven't incurred a lot of costs along those lines. We've just reallocated people's yeah. time and, and the resources that you had budgeted for in a different way. So yeah. uh, there are, is, are there, is there federal money to cover the anticipated expenses? Yeah, there is. It's, it's a muddle though. I mean, there's not a lot of, uh, uh, we've been going back and forth and I think I told you the last time we talked, it's, there's a lot of, um, I don't know how to put this, but there's just a lot of, of uh, 
back and forth on how these monies are going to get distributed and what's eligible and what's not eligible and what's the best way to get the money. Do we want to put it into a surplus for FY22? Do we want to cover the expenses? Some of the school districts have, between the, the, the uh, repurposed money and the, and the actual cost of things, they've, they've claimed as much as $8 million, you know? So there's a lot of uh, controversy around that. But I, as you can see from what I've talked to you, I, I went in and I used actuals in my mind. And I, and I came up with about $116,000 worth of refundable expenditures. And one of them, one of them is the principals and uh, the executive staff in Heartland's time for the summer and things like that. And so we, we put together, I put together the grant and then I, so that, and they're telling us, they being the AOE are telling us to be kind of in a backhanded handed way, you know, be liberal, you know, don't, don't be afraid to, repurpose things because the more we spend because they're afraid they're not going to be able to spend all the money by the end of the by the end of december and they have to spend it in this year so then we get an email from the the, the part of the aoe that does the oversight and they give us a 32 page document of what we're going to have to work required to have to support the expenditures so on the one hand, they're saying, yeah, that could be repurposed and that could be repurposed. And on the other hand, we're getting this guidance from their their uh, monitoring group that says, uh, yeah, but you can't do that. And yes, you can do this. So I, I'm being pretty conservative. And as, as I said before, I, some of what I've claimed, I'm not sure. I, I, I mean, some of the executive time, meaning the superintendent's time, one of the things that I've run into is it, excuse me, not the superintendent, but the principal, is when I said that our principal spent the whole summer and the, and the assistant principal spent the whole summer doing planning for the pandemic, I mean, I think that's accurate. I think it's really accurate. <laughs> but I, I can confirm their question, to, <laughs> their question to me was, well, what did they normally do? So what weren't they doing when they were doing the COVID planning. We didn't take any vacation time at all. So there you go. <laughs> right. So that's, that's one of the questions that I have to, that, that they're going to be asking me. And that's one of the ones I stumbled on. Cause I, I don't know what a full-time principal does during the summer at the schools. So that's one of the ones I've been going back and forth with David on and, and trying to get some, some, so that's where we are on the federal money. There's money that we're calling CRF. That's what I just got through talking to. There's another group of money called ESSER. This ESSER money they've told us to try to spend in the spring rather than during the school year because they want to maximize the amount of expenditures they can put into the CRF grant. So I, I think that safe to say you're going to get some of the money back. None of what I've sent in has been approved. There's been a lot of... Uh, questions but nobody said yes you're going to get the money yet um so the fourth question he asked is looking ahead to the budget process for fy22 what conditions can be predicted that might affect heartland's budget and the local tax rate well i sent along another sheet um that had some, that outlined what makes up the ed fund what are the what are the sources of the ed fund and as you can see a large portion of that of the uh, ed fund is our property taxes, and then the, the other revenue sources that they talk about are rooms and meals tax, and and these are all taxes that are have been projected to have increasingly large shortfalls. So, the short answer to that question is: Well, if those other revenue sources are short, then they're going to have to make that up some way. Now, part of that way is to set aside some of the CRF money. And the other way would be to potentially go back and raise property taxes. So there is that potential, but I can't give you a definitive answer on how that's going to look. I mean, I don't think there's anybody in the state that knows that quite yet. But I think common sense would dictate that this would be the year to be very, very conservative in your budgeting. 
and I've had that conversation with Christine as well. You know, we, we, you know, one of the things that I've run into this as I go through the budget process is the way that we're structured. They want some of the principals want to know how do we budget? Do we budget for a normal school year or do we budget for a COVID year? And I don't know how to put, how to answer that question. So what we're trying to budget for now is September of 2021. Um, I would I would say that you would budget. Well, I'm going to be optimistic here. I, I would say you budget as if it were a normal school year with the same staff that you would need to teach your kids as normal, all being there all day, every day. There are people, there are some principals that are saying that you could potentially realize some savings if you didn't budget that way. But I don't know if that's a safe thing to do at this point. And finally, I think I, I think that's the only other question you had in there. Yeah. So, having said all that, is are there any questions? Ed, uh, do you remember where? Um, maybe somebody on this call remembers where Heartland ended up last year uh, for FY twenty. Um, yeah, it you, was, I think it was about. I, I, I'll double check here, but I think it was one hundred and fifty thousand in the red. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That, right. Yeah, and I know that that was due to, well, partly due to unbudgeted tuition expenses. Right. Mm -hmm. We had like eight or nine kids. Yep. That we hadn't anticipated. Yeah. Um, and that was one of my questions: is looking at tuition. Um, it looks like we budgeted mm -hmm. correctly for tuition this year. No, so, actually, I haven't gotten all the bills in yet. Okay. But what I did was I. I, I uh, encumbered to budget. What we have to do, what we normally do is we wait for that first semester uh, bill and then we use that to create a purchase order for the whole year. And we don't have, so who are we? I we don't have all of them in yet. They usually come in in October. So maybe by next yep. month we'll have we, Yeah. We, we definitely added some high school students that we did not anticipate this year. Yeah. Um, we also lost a few, so it may wash. It probably not wash, but it might help. Okay. So, so we the, the, to answer your question, the deficit from the the, the one you're bringing forward into the FY twenty two budget year is uh, one hundred and fifty one thousand uh, six hundred one uh, negative. Okay, well, I think that was better Thank than you. the deficit we brought into this year. Um, yeah. <laughs> it'd be nice to not have a deficit if we could figure out how many kids we have. Um, okay. okay. Uh, the, any other board members have questions? Hey, Ed, could you add anything to the um, Thetford tuition question? I, I, I just know. I think it's a it's a miscommunication at the state level. I think there's one arm in the state that's saying you know they're blood they're they're doing an audit on uh, the tuition because somebody up there said that we pay too much tuition and then there's the, they're saying that Thetford's was never accepted as one of those tuitions that was grandfathered in and we've been always led to believe by the AOE that Thetford St John's Barry those schools all of them we paid we pay the full amount of their tuition because they were grandfathered in. So, so schools like uh, Waldorf and, and Sharon Academy get the state average. And there's therein lies the dispute. And what I did was I connected the, the auditing agency with the AOE and they've been going back and forth ever since. I mean, I don't know where that stands, but in my experience, uh, I don't ask them that question until they ask me a question. Yeah. Because I, I don't think we've done anything wrong. I mean, we've been doing this since I started and before I started. I, I, I was doing it thir almost 25, 30 years ago. So that's that's been the case for a long, long time. Um, but it's good to let the state auditors, you know, have it out with the AOE because then they don't bother us. We'll let them figure it out. I don't think there's really anything to figure out. No, I think it, well, they've got to find the document that says, I think that's what they're trying to do. Like, where did that happen? You know, but I don't know. We'll see. 
Well, Maybe. and I think that I think Nicole pointed it out. That the language was really ambiguous. Yeah. What they were looking for was a motion from the school board. No, oh, that's not that's not going to happen. Well, no, but I mean that it's not something that the school board was ever ever had to make a motion for. It was known through statute that we were supposed to pay, and they're going back to the statute. And the AOE is kind of caught in the middle of this, saying, "Wait a minute, right. our advice has always been to pay the tuition." So I. I think this thing will take care of itself. I hope so. I, I don't know what the resolution would be. Well, the good news is Thetford would, would owe us a boatload of money. Yeah, and they'd go out of business. Okay. Um, so I think going forward with budgeting, I, I kind of, and I, I would like some board input on this, is that I kind of concur with Ed and that for next September, we should pretend that maybe this is behind us and we can have a normal school year. Um, but I do, I do wonder um, with the pod structure that we have, um, if, if we can learn some lessons from how this is in, um, impacting us behaviorally and maybe not have as many people um, if we could do this. Yeah, Brittany, go ahead. So I want input. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I recently, um, and I, I haven't compiled all of the information, but I'm happy to share it with the board when I do, but I sent out a survey last week to teachers just saying what, you know, what things are going really well in your classroom behaviorally that's resulting in this 71% decrease. Um, and I'm still collecting more and more information every day, but um, but there was a lot of really good feedback that we're going to kind of compile and say, okay, let's look at this and see what we can keep in place if we if we had a typical school year. Um, so hopefully that will be really helpful moving forward. When you say um, less people, Nikki, uh, what do you mean by that? Because I think part of what's working is we're, we're using all our people just yeah. in a different way. <laughs> well, yeah. And so, yeah. And I, I recognize that. Um, and I guess I just, I wonder, um, I mean, I, I, by less people, I don't mean a lot less people. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, we've got, we've got one-on-ones and we've got BIs and we've got, you know, extra paras. And um, yeah. I just wonder if, some of those kids are doing a lot better because of the way that we've restructured school that maybe some kids, and I know we don't have a lot of one-on-ones. I think we have two, um, if I'm remembering right, or do we have more than that? Um, no. Yeah. So I don't know, like, I guess I'm just throwing it out there. I, um, and, and part of this, if I was going to send you guys an email, part of this is coming from our family's experience in that, um, your <laughs> transitions is mm -hmm. fantastic. It's wonderful. Um, yeah, and that's really cut down on behaviors. But the other thing that um, his, and I, I don't know, I mean, maybe this is only my child, but um, they've developed trust mm -hmm. because they're seeing a teacher. So, like, there have been teachers in the school that have been there for two years that my child has never trusted because they see them once a week for a half hour or 40 minutes, right. and that's yeah. not enough to establish trust. Mm -hmm. And after one week of having them in the classroom, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah. all of a sudden everything's changed. And Yeah, the, ha having the related arts teachers, um, and it's not perfect yet, but, but doing some co-teaching, being in the classroom with the teacher, leading some of the um, learning, you know, with the teacher as the support, you know, the classroom teacher as the support, is really a model I'd love to replicate going forward. I mean, I think it's working. Not every kid gets every special every week, but that that's okay. I mean, what they're gaining, you know, offsets that, I, I believe. Um, yeah. I think not eating in the cafeteria, I mean, many of our behavior issues were during the lunch time. Um, I don't know if teachers love having kids eating in the classroom, but it sure is. It's almost like a family dinner, right? You're, you're eating with your with your pod or your, your classroom. So there's, there's lots I'd like to carry forward um, with what we're doing. Uh, you know, some of it, you know, raises the issue. Well, if, 
teachers are with the kids all day, what time does school end? Or how do we use our staff uh, in a different way to you know make the day longer, but still keep this structure in place? Um, so yeah, lots to think about. And I think you know in terms of budgeting for next year, I, I mean, I think the safe thing is to budget like school is gonna be back to normal, but I, I feel like this is the new normal kind of, I'd like to keep it this way. But the, the questions for me are, you know, we, we're, we're, we've got um, an additional LNA. Do I carry that forward? Will we need that next year? I don't know. Will COVID be gone? You know, we've hired up, we, today we hired a permanent sub. Will we need that next year? Um, because that's a, you know, that's a person that is guaranteed to work every day. And <laughs> it's kind of funny because I don't think we ever had a day with it where we didn't need subs last year, the year before. But you know, there might be some days where you don't. So it's it's just trying to make the best decisions with what we know. Um, but basically it's, um, I've already sent out a memo to the staff in terms of supplies. It's still not the time to buy extra. We're gonna just keep it bare, bare minimum for next year. Um, not that that's a bit, not, not that that's big ticket items because it's really not in a, in a big budget, but it's one thing we have control over. Um, and then staffing. So that's where we're at. And Ed's been, Ed's been wonderful. He's been really uh, a good teacher in this new e-finance system. He hasn't given me all the keys yet, I believe, but some of them, he's giving me more access as I request it. So. Hey, Christine, is, yeah. is the, um, is a permanent sub um, licensed? Uh, they do not have to be licensed, no. But if well, they're if they're a permanent sub, are they are they credentialed some way? No, they're doing by permanent. It means they work only for Heartland. But they're right. doing day. They're doing a. Day. They might do a day here, two days there, two days in this classroom. So they're not they're not like a long term sub. Right which is what I think you're referring to, Scott. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's really to keep just one person, one additional person in our building. We don't wanna bring in any, uh, the fewer people in the building, the better. So this is one consistent person that can sub anywhere in the building, if that makes sense. Um, and we're lucky with, with the one that we're hiring now. Um, he was licensed uh, in, in 2017. Early. I think he let his license lapse for elementary ed, but he was licensed, um, yeah. which, is, which is great. So he, he does have quite a bit of experience. Um, Sounds good. Areas. Yeah. Sounds exciting. Um, Brittany, do, do you have something else? Uh, I think I was just going to talk about one other thing that, you know, of course, is coming back from the survey is just the smaller class sizes and the impact of that. Mm -hmm. But to get smaller class sizes, there are other costs like, you know, you get smaller class sizes because you're using all of the staff you possibly have, which doesn't leave intervention. But at the same time, if you have smaller class sizes, you might not need as much intervention because you have more staff and a smaller class size. So it's it's like this you know, kind of balancing act that we're, we're trying to work through. So, but there would be a lot more data as the year goes on about all of that information. So the information that I gathered is really just very preliminary, like, hey, what are we seeing right now? And then we'll, we'll do follow up throughout the year um, as well. Sarah, did you have something? You're on mute. Sorry. <laughs> Um, I was just thinking about as we sort of rejiggered everybody this year, how are there any holes that we then are going to have to fill? Like I was thinking the the library position, right? Mm -hmm. That one that that's going to be a totally new hire, the library STEM, right? Because we've used our librarian STEM teacher as a classroom mm -hmm. teacher or... Yes, but she'll go back to she'll go. Tina will go back to being the library STEM teacher, and the way we did that, we had some combined grade levels. Right. And, okay. So, so that we won't have to make that up. Well, if we want to keep small classes and not, <laughs> then then we then we will somehow. Okay, so that's maybe one. So that's one sort of new hire to to kind of fill in. I'm just thinking about how we sort of mm -hmm. pull from different places and where do we have to fill in. Um, yeah, I also have yeah. two interventionists that are classroom teachers right now. Right. So if we want interventionists back, 
you pull and, them out of the mix and you combine some classes, which makes larger groups. And we didn't, and we did not ever um, replace uh, our part-time interventionist, Teresa. So that's part of the cost savings, I'm sure that Ed is, is showing. Yeah. And we also have 50 more kids in theory in September. Right, back in school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 There are some. There's a lot to think about. <laughs> yeah. You know, one thing I do have to say that I think is is going pretty well is, um, you know, using our lodge staff in the in the classroom as like hands on, first hand intervention before things kind of go south versus being more reactionary, which is what they've been in the past, and I. I do think that, that that seems to be going really well and we are moving them around um, minimally, but a little bit based on the data that we're seeing, uh, the behavior data that we're seeing coming in. So um, we'll keep collecting data on that too and see how we can best utilize them. If we're um, throwing out ideas about you know how to go forward as we begin budgeting, I guess I would share that it would I'm not comfortable acting as if the next school year will be a quote normal school year. Yeah. I, I I feel like more of the same is more likely, at least to start with. Um, I don't know that I don't have a crystal ball, but I just I think it would be easier to let down our guard if we if we were really able to rather than trying to uh, start up again. You know, I mean, it would be, be easier to keep this this boat sailing. Um, I think one thing that comes to my mind, folks, is that it, I, when Ed was speaking about the um, CARES funds, I think that's what it was. I don't know. Is Ed still on the phone? Yeah. Um, yeah. And that I understand there's a time limit, I think, we, of, uh, of the end of the year. That is, that is really a juxtaposition of, as, a, as a community representative. So I, I guess it's really a whole other animal, but I just wanted to say out loud, like, nothing makes like the blood come to my face than being like the spring of the school year and overhearing at a school board meeting that there's a basket full of money that was in the budget and we need to spend that because as a community member i don't i don't want to hear that i want to hear like correct spending and spending that needs to be done and not not spending the budget anytime just because it was put in the budget nine months ago so i just think that's that's worth like saying out loud um like I said, it's a whole other basket of money, but it's still the same people that are uh, in charge of that financial management. <clears throat> I don't, Scott, I, I, that's not what I hear, hear, hear Ed say at all. You know, I, what I heard is that he's being really careful and really, you know, and, and not feeling like he's charging CARES Act stuff. That doesn't, that's why the whole idea of like, what are, how can we charge the principal's time in the summer? You know, because that was a significant change from past years. And what does that look like? So that's not what I heard Ed saying was that we were going beyond the budget or changing that. It's more, it's what I heard is that Ed was really looking at it really, really closely to make sure we could be reimbursed to the fullest but not over the line in any way. I mean, that's, I didn't hear that. I agree. I agree with you, Beth. I, it's, I was more or less just um, bringing up like historically that's. Yeah. And I don't think the community, uh, the community should have the, um, should trust that, um, that we're because the budget is always an estimate. I, I, I'm totally on the side of that the budget is an estimate. And and it really when you think about the timing associated with the school district operations, it, you really can't have any 
other outlook, I don't believe that the budget is an estimate. And so we all understand that life goes on and that we come springtime that there just may not be a need for what we budgeted for. Yeah, um, I, I, I think to Scott's, to Scott's point, I, I don't think he was necessarily talking about the CARES money, but I know, for example, we do have a district that will remain unnamed. Uh, Ed certainly can attest to this, though, but sometimes in the spring they find out that they've got a fairly substantial surplus. Right now, that's just an estimate. <clears throat> but let's say you get your second quarter report or you get your third quarter report. And, and, and I've seen this board, not the Heartland board, say, well, we've got this money, let's, let's buy this or let's buy that. Or, you know, I, I think it's okay to land at the end of the year with a surplus if you have to land with a surplus. And I think this board has always pretty much understood that. And I think that's the way we'll operate. Um, you know, and you can't, you can't predict. I mean, I, I, I think the, I had a superintendent one time tell me that, you know, if you can land within one to 3% on either side of your budget, surplus or deficit, you're probably doing pretty well because it's all, so, especially in this time and, you know, day and age, it, it's it's all an estimate, as, as Scott said. So I think we'll see what happens. My guess is that that, that's, that number is going to change as we go on, uh, but I think we have saved some money in some areas, and that's a good thing. Hey, well, if, well, I, one more thing. I'm sorry. Um, when I I heard loud and clear that it was getting cold and the doors were still open, Christine. Yeah. Is there any? Um, well, that's really like a. I know um, it feels wrong, <laughs> but you're, you're breaking Scott's household rules. You no, can't. no, that's just like that's interesting. It's very interesting, and I understand that we're when we're trying to mm -hmm. be. There are a lot of goals to meet here, basically. That's what, and so I wonder if they must be helping um, district leaders like understand like the size of the room or something, and how often the door would need to be open, or or if it should ever be shut. Or there, there, the guidance is that the door should be open and, yeah. and windows. So, uh, you know. I've told staff, you don't have to have them 100% like wide open. You can, you know, maybe put something in the door to let fresh air in. But um, to be honest, Scott, some staff need the door open to feel safe. Yeah. They just do. And, um, and um, it does, I mean, the heat, uh, before the heat was on and the doors were open, it, I was freezing, literally. And I, I'm, I'm typically cold, but it was cold. Um, now that the heat's on, it, it feels reasonable. Um, but it is, it feels like you're, you're just wasting energy, right? Because the door's open. So, um, I, I don't know the answer to that, <laughs> except we're supposed to keep them open. Same with bus, bus windows. Following the guidance is the way to go. That's exactly, yeah. I'm with you. Yeah. Do you, is, do you foresee it changing for winter? I mean, it's cold possibly now like what's it going to be like if it's 10 degrees outside yeah i i don't know colleen um but it is all about uh, you know it's it's they call it what do they call it the swiss cheese approach it's like the masking the distance the ventilation airflow all of I'm those just things. wondering if it's going to be doable if there's snow coming yeah. in the door <laughs> that might not be right <laughs> No, I, I don't think know. as it gets colder, I'm, I'm guessing they're going to start to just be cracked open instead of wide open. But, um, you know, staff are still I playing. Just, they're happens, going yeah. outside. They'll, they'll continue to go outside. And when they're outside, the doors are closed, obviously. But um, it is great to see them outside, I have to tell you. It's pretty, it's pretty awesome. Do, are the eighth graders going outside as much? I hear a little bit of whining in my house. They, they they're not as much. Um, no, I mean it's more. It, it starts uh, the most. I would say the younger kids go out the most. As you get older, it's harder to. What they're teaching is harder to teach outside um, because they rely on their Promethean boards and other things that they don't have outside. So it does get more challenging. Um, but we'll we'll remind. You know, it is good to be outside when you can be. It also took it. quite a long time to get some of the um, middle school supplies in because, I mean, we were just short supplied and 
the orders. Okay. Everybody was ordering everything all at the same time. So it took a long time to get those in. And the more they the got in, a little, they got out a little bit more, but that did take quite a while. So, okay. Yeah. How, how's the gear situation? Like, or do we still need gear for kids? Like as we move forward? Cause I mean, eighth graders, you know, love to wear their shorts all summer, all winter. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like, They'll um, stop if they get cold. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. Oh, I think we're good. None of mine will. Christine. Pretty good. Yeah. Yes, Ed. Yeah, I just wanted to say, I for some reason I I couldn't get myself unmuted, but two things. One is that um, you're going to have to, as a board and the schools, all of them are going to have to anticipate increase in energy. It's yeah. only because, as as you've outlined, the the way they've dictated you you've got to exchange the air in the in your rooms mm -hmm. every twenty minutes. And to that end, that means you're bringing in cold air to, to and blowing out warm air. So you're going to have to. It's going to be chilly. Yeah. There's no way around that. Um, the second part is is there's different CR CRF monies that are available, and one of them was from uh, Efficiency Vermont, and Heartland got a significant amount of money from Efficiency Vermont in the in the $125,000 range. And it still hasn't been finalized like all the CRF money, but that money was put towards um, getting your air handlers and your air circulation and HVAC system up to, up to par. Still now on there's it. money. I, I put in another 33,000 into the CRF grant. That is the one I had talked about earlier. And it's not clear to me whether they're going to allow that expense, but if they don't allow that expense, then, I'm asking the board tonight if, if they would be okay with taking that money out of your capital reserve fund. Because if we, we have to, we being, Heartland has to be willing to complete the project. And if you're going to get 125000 in money from Efficiency Vermont and the CRF, then I, w I think that it's a good idea to commit 33000 out of your capital reserve. In order to commit from our capital reserve, that requires a vote at town meeting, correct? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So you're you're giving us that long of a time frame to think this yeah. through. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, and, and the um, improvement to the air handling system is something that will improve the air handling system beyond this year and maybe next, correct? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it will make it so that the system can be uh, it can be handled from a remote basis. Automated. You could yeah. you can do it from your phone, and I think Jim showed you, didn't he, Christine? What the, the system's yeah. capable of? Yeah. yeah. And, and the system in Heartland is unfortunately, unfortunately, this the the pandemic has has um, brought to light a lot of shortcomings and a lot of other opportunities, and this is an opportunity to get that system up and operational. Yeah, they're, they're, still, they're still working on it. Um, the guy's there uh, from C Control Technologies, I believe, and he works after the kids leave every day. So, in process. And, and the other thing I was gonna say is, I think that the conversation that you had earlier that was triggered by um, uh, Nikki's ask about what were the lessons and Brittany's response about what were the lessons? I think that's an invaluable conversation and I commend you for having it because it's going to make, it's going to be difficult. There are, I've already said to Christine that if it comes down to it and as you all well know is anytime you're going to make any significant changes in your budget, that, I mean, supplies will get you a couple of thousand here and there, but you really have to look at staffing and that's a conversation that needs to emanate from the app board. And the, really, to have it in an open forum like this is a, that's a good start. Thanks for your vote of confidence. Ed. <laughs> I, I don't know that we got anywhere on that conversation, but um, no, and I'm I, certainly I not. I don't hear it a lot. I don't hear that kind of conversation a lot. And it's you're talking about. Uh, education and things like that and not talking about money, which is important. I think those are the things like you, every crisis has opportunity and Brittany just outlined one and Christine talking about people not 
whether or not they go to the cafeteria, I never would have known that. <laughs> I used oh, to love God. the cafeteria. Oh yeah, kids love it. It's <laughs> it's a nightmare <laughs> right now. Christine and I get to deliver lunches, which we love. We do. <laughs> <laughs> we do. And I, I will say, since it is a public forum, um, when I brought that up, I wasn't intending to cut any staff. I was specifically looking at not hiring new people. That, right? Yeah, not hiring new. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, no, but I do want to collate all that information for you guys once I get more of it. We yeah. we just started that collection, and so I'm I actually have you can come in and see it all up on my wall. It's all taped <laughs> to the wall right now that I'm trying to compare what's working and and maybe what we can improve on. So um, I do think that will be very informative yeah, moving good. forward. Yeah, and it's just a preliminary thought. It just seems like you know, out of crisis comes opportunity, and mm -hmm. let's no, see if we can capitalize. And I think the fact that Christine has looked at that pod structure and I mean, we, we just see so many advantages to that. And mm -hmm. if one of them is to look at staffing patterns, then we can do that. But I, I yep. think, yeah, that, that, that's a good idea. We need to do that as a whole. We do. We do. Thanks. Is there Ed. Any, yeah. Thank you, Ed. Does anybody have any other questions for Ed or are we let, good to let Ed continue on with his evening? Okay. Thank you very, thank Ed, you very much. Ed, thank you for hanging out with us for an hour and 50 minutes. <laughs> we appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks. Thank Bye -bye. you. Have a good night. Okay. Um, so I'm going to go back up to the top of the uh, agenda with the principal's report. Christine right. sent out earlier. Do you want to share your screen or do we all have a second? I'll She's share. Gonna share. She's going to share. It's, it's, it's not a long report. It's short. I assumed we'd be talking about other things, so I didn't include them, but um, let me present here. Okay. All right. So um, we are in the middle. I think I mentioned this earlier. In the middle of TMP testing, actually, we're at the end. We're just doing makeups this week for kids that, that weren't able to um, complete complete um, TMP testing. And um, as, as Dr. Baker predicted, yeah, we, we didn't, um, we're doing okay on our TMP scores. Uh, the MTSS academic uh, leadership team meets tomorrow. We're going to, we're going to dive in and look more specifically, but in general, we want to be in the blue or the green. And these are um, class averages, scaled scores. So, um, each grade level and remote students are also participating in TMP. So in math, you know, as, as grade level cohorts, everybody's in the blue and green. There are definitely kids when I dive down into the grade levels where there are kids in the yellow and red that need additional support. So that's really important information for us. So that's math and that Which is- Which is better, blue or green? Green is better. So we're doing okay. The blue is, it, yeah, blue is in the um, range of proficient. Awesome. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Overall, um, you know, we were we were concerned. We didn't know where kids would be, and uh, you know, this is one measure. Teachers are doing other measures right now, um, F and P tests, um, uh, running records, and and things like that. But this is good initial data. Um, that's coming in again. It's not quite. We're not quite done yet, but we will be this week. Um, we are continuing our work, although we're not going to be um, contracting with Leader and Me this year. Uh, some of our cost savings came from <laughs> that money that we put aside, but we are trying to continue um, using the traits. Um, you know, the Seven Habits of Healthy Kids. Brittany's um, working hard at making sure. The, the teachers have resources to teach the, the habits and um, going in and reading books, recording videos, and we're doing what we can to keep it moving forward. We will be uh, having nominations are in process right now for student of the month, which the first habit was um, being proactive. So those, those kids will be honored um, at the beginning, beginning of November. Um, one comment on that that just yeah. popped into my head um, since since your parents are your um, assistants this year, it might be nice to send them a note. And maybe you did, and some mm -hmm. of us don't read our notes. But um, yeah, it, 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 just be quick. This is, 
Yep. Yeah, this is our habit and this is how it's expressed in a kid. I, I don't know, like just a short two or three bullets on the habit and why it's good you, or how you, you do it. think it would be valuable for me because there are a lot of parent resources online mm -hmm. um, for teaching these. In fact, a lot of the book that that's on the slide actually is designed for parents and it has activities in the back or whatever. Um, would it be, I don't want to overwhelm parents is, is kind of what I was thinking. So I didn't know if it would be valuable to in the Monday memo to put a, here's the activity of the week or of the month for, for this character trait. Um, I don't know. We could also work on, um, I mean, the, the teachers are teaching the, the traits in school, but maybe a focus in the afternoon, Brittany, some teachers, um, giving parents access to that, access to them that way as well. But yeah, we can work on that. Yeah, let's think about it. Yeah, and honestly, like, so, um, like many other parents, I'm completely overwhelmed all the time. Right. Um, if you just gave me three or four bullets, like if I knew that, the, like I can think of things knowing now that the character trait of the month was be proactive, there are just ways that I would have fit Real. that what? in even okay. with my child's behavior today. Um, mm -hmm. And so just to be able to carry that through, even if it's during dinner time and other times of the day, just to, to say, oh, you're being proactive, that's awesome. And yeah. Is the Monday memo a good way to get that out to people? Well, that's for the staff. You mean the Wildcat Weekly? Oh, I'm sorry, the Wildcat Weekly. <laughs> yeah, Wildcat Weekly. Weekly. Yeah, I think that would be yeah. great. Just to, okay. just like three or four bullets in the Wildcat Weekly. And more information is great, but just to um, somewhere really short yeah. um, for those of us that don't always okay. follow through as they well as we'd like. A lot of resources <laughs> that are just, that are very short, like here are three things that you could do this week to promote, to promote be proactive. So yeah, we can definitely do that. That's a great idea. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I, think it would be great. I don't know if we're as like people that are watching over children and their afternoon work, if there's other ways for them to like give um, caught you cards or things like that. Um, just if there's, you know, cause I'm just saying that's really proactive if kids are actually doing their work on their own. Yep. <laughs> yep. Cool. So I'm um, sharing that to... and stuff like that. Yeah, last year we tried a Google form that parents could fill out and submit, um, and then we would we would represent that. We didn't get too too much turnout for that. I think it might have been the design wasn't maybe fantastic uh, for parents to be able to easily access it. So, uh, but we can we can certainly think about how to how to do that. I think other schools have done it before, so I'll do some research on that. I would even say just maybe telling parents they can email their teacher if their kid does something great at home. Yeah. Finding a form for me would be the thing that stopped me. <laughs> would it be now that the kids are back and forth, Nikki, if we sent home just um, blank wild cards for parents to fill out to send back in, would that be a, an easy way or not? I think um, I, I'm speaking for my family. I think my kids would find it really cheesy to get one from me. Okay. I think it would lose its it would lose its value coming from Got me. Um, but if I were like, mm -hmm. so the same information, if I were to email the teacher and be like, hey, I was really proud because so-and-so did this. And then the teacher said, hey, your mom said she was really proud. Then the kid would yeah. feel. Got it. I don't yeah. know. That's the psychology of our house. <laughs> no, that makes sense. Totally. Okay, we'll work on that. I wrote it on my list. Um, I don't, I, I know I put this on the my presentation last month, but I don't think I got to this last slide. Um, we are using Heartland Connects. I don't know if, if any of you have seen it. Um, Tina Skihan was the um, kind of lead on this. She put it together and, and we really wanted parents to have one, one place to go for all of the remote things that need to happen. And, um, and staff are using it. They're putting their newsletters, they've got schedules, uh, links to where people, uh, the kids need to go. So it's, it's, it's working pretty well. I love feedback from parents. Um, if any of you have used it or, or not and find it useful, that would be good information. At some point, maybe we'll have, have you, it sounds like Nikki, you wanna say something? I can't see well, you, but. I, I'll say that it's really helpful to, to be okay. able to go to one place that's not, that's not controlled by my kids. So I don't have to open up one Chromebook and try and figure out what's going on over here and then go to the other Chromebook and figure out what's going on. 
just to be so, able to, because what I'm doing is on Mondays before I pick the kids up from school, I'm going to Heartland next and, and trying to figure out what their week looks like so that I can. You can plan it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Right. So I am finding it very helpful. Um, okay. And I was also going to say, Scott, you can connect too. There's no mm -hmm. parent login. You can just Google Heartland Connects and check it out if you want to. I, do. Just, I was just trying to find it right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's totally right. open. And yeah, it's so. on the dashboard, Scott. Um, okay. If you go to, no, if well, you can go access it through the dashboard, or you can access it through our homepage. I think it's under Parent, if I remember correctly. Yeah. So you can go to Parent, and then it says Heartland Connects on there. So you can you can check it out either way. Thank you. Yeah, it's really great too because teachers get to see what other teachers are doing. Um, our I, like I shared earlier, our fourth grade teachers piloted remote afternoons first and created a, some great links uh, and plans on, on Heartland Connects and shared it out with the rest of the staff. So it's it's a good tool for, for helping um, each other as well. So we'll keep that. Yeah, I'm, I'm finding it great, just especially with the younger kids, because then I'm not relying on a second grader to have their appropriate bookmarks marked. Good. Um, which doesn't always happen. Good. Um, so yeah, that's hugely helpful. Well, that's good to hear. That was that was a hope. So yeah. Well, no, and it seems so much more transparent because I always felt like I was logging into like their seesaw. What are your assignments? What is this? I mean, I yeah. still have to do a little bit of that, but it's more like I can get a cursory overview of what the expectations are for the afternoon pretty easily. That's, that's great. Uh, I will share that information with the staff. They'll they'll appreciate it. Um, quick update on acceptance and understanding. They continue to. Um, provide professional development um, at staff meetings. So we are at, um, we are at uh, finalizing definitions of some, of some key words, which, which was interesting the other night at, um, Nikki and I were at the anti-racism task force preliminary committee. I, I'm not sure what we're called, Nikki, but um, talking about what is the definition of, of um, discrimination and racism. And so this, our staff is wrestling with that as well. So it'll, it'll be nice to have some common definitions of what those words mean. Um, so that's what we worked on last month, uh, getting feedback to some pre preliminary ideas and, and they're gonna revisit that at the next staff meeting. But moving forward with that work. And then the, the other thing that we're um, spending time learning about at staff meetings is um, trauma and how to become a trauma uh, informed school. And this is a big initiative in our whole SU and we have a very active champions group within our building and they, um, they're doing some educating at, at staff meetings as well. Um, I think I met with them last week and I think we're gonna take a pause and just do a check-in at the next staff meeting. It feels like staff need to need to do that. And that's really important. Um, the man that is um, our lead in trauma work is Dave Malnick. And he is a firm believer in just stopping and uh, doing some reflective practice as a staff to build um, trust and um, cohesion. And he, he does it with the administrative team regularly. We usually all end up um, in tears. So I'm hoping, <laughs> which is good for us sometimes. So that group is leading that work. And then um, we put out a survey. I would say Angie did most of the work. Week five it was a similar survey to week one. It was a staff survey and it had some of the same questions. Um, in hindsight, I probably should have done a comparison of week one and week five, but overall, um, people, you know, more than 50% of the people feel pr very safe. Some are still not sure. Um, very few feel, you know, unsafe, which is, which is good. Um, transitions, how are, how are transitions in, in the, in and out of the building going pretty well? I will say in, in Heartland, we do have one way hallways right now. And I think as the weather starts to get really cold, we may consider a, just dividing the hallway into a two lane hallway. And I to think. be clear, that basically they're not really transitioning. It's just yeah. for bathroom Bathrooms. usage and things like that, not classes or. Anything. Right. And then I think um, 
this is about building cleanliness and I think we've really flushed out and worked out the disinfecting schedule and everybody feels like, um, you know, the maintenance staff has been working incredibly um, hard for the past, I don't know, eight months, however long we've been at this, but they, um, I, I think the staff is, is feeling that the building is being taken care of. And this is SU, SU wide results, not just Heartland. And that is the end of my report. So let me stop sharing and take any questions or. Thank you, Christine. That was really yeah. awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm trying not to make it too, too long because I know we talk about other things throughout the meeting, but just give you a sense of where we're at and what we're doing. And right. did I stop presenting? Yeah. yeah. You did. Okay, yeah, sorry. You did. We're all back. You're good. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Any other questions for Christine? No. So David, you're up. Superintendent's report. Yeah. So I, I really, you know, again, it's always good to follow Christine because she covers a lot of the things that we're working on. And um, the only two things I would add is just in light of Ed's report, you know, we, we do have to keep our mindset now geared toward budgeting. I think we're going to, our goal is to have a draft SU budget ready for the next SU meeting. So, because that always drives the assessment piece for all of the individual districts and it gives us a baseline to start putting the rest of the budget together. So again, it there there's not going to be much like most of the local districts, we're not going to have any huge initiatives, anything added, um, you know, we, uh, we'll, we'll look at some of the, you know, Katie, to her credit, she's on with us tonight, but she got the special ed service plan, which is probably 80% of the SU budget is special education, but she got that done early this year. So Ed's had those numbers to, to, uh, to play with. And to Katie's credit, she's kept it in the, in the, I think, I don't know, the increase was what Katie, Two percent, three percent. I don't even know what the. <laughs> it, there wasn't an increase. We kept it. it All right, good. It was level. I think I, I think it's twenty dollars over if it is anything, but it which in an eight million dollar budget, I think that's yeah twenty. We'll take it, but, right but, but I don't think there was an increase. I will triple check. I've been doing it piecemeal the past couple of days, so. Um, to fill it in. So sorry to interrupt. No, no, that's right. That's yeah, right. It's it's bug me. I knew it was while long. we're on that. I didn't no, know it was that I, long. But go ahead, Nikki. Yeah, I, just while we were on that, Katie, I just want to give you a huge shout out. Shout out that that is just awesome because in previous years we've waited forever for that information and weren't sure where it was coming from, and it was always an enormous increase. And and I just like thank you. <laughs> I know it's hard to pull together, and I'm just really happy to hear that update at this point in the year. I just want to add, um, part of the reason that things are are working as well as they they have been is the um, uh, the the connection between regular ed and special ed staff. I mean, they're working together. We're not there's not a a line drawn in the sand. We're all on the same team, and we're working together, and that feels really good. And I think kids feel that as well. So. Yeah, no, that's and that's that's across the. That's good SD. news. So mm -hmm. that's very good news. Yeah, very good news. And then the only other thing, other than the stuff we've already reported out, and uh, is, uh, and I know Nikki will will talk a little bit about the anti-racism task force, so I'm not going to go there. But it's negotiations, and we can talk more specifically. I think we do need a very brief executive session tonight. We can talk, with, but I can say publicly that we we did hit. You know, impasse. We, you know, we we both can't. You know, we can't <clears throat> any further alone. So that's going to mean uh, you start usually with mediation. We'll we'll bring in a mutually agreed to mediator. Uh, we'll put our proposals that are still left on the table on the table, and they'll put theirs. And the mediator will run back and forth between the two rooms. It'll be virtual, so the mediator is not going to cost as much as it has. In the past, because usually you have to pay travel and lodging and a full day's worth of mediation time. So, and we split that cost with the association. So it, it, it's too bad. I, I I don't think we're that far apart. Um, but uh, we we can give you a little more detail in executive session. But but that's that that's 
and we have a couple of other things to share in executive session too that are personnel related but we'll wait until we go there that's it for me thank you david um okay so moving right along that uh brings us to the portrait of a graduate update which i think is angie or is that me yeah, no angie can give that because she's been working hard with mike Nicholson on that piece i can give that and what it is is the strategic plan is going to the board chairs on Wednesday evening and Mike is joining us and he's going to walk us through the process that the strategic plan was created through and then um, answer any questions, anticipate any questions that may come out when we share it with the whole um, board next week. Is it next week? Yeah. I think yeah. Next so Monday. Um, looking forward to that. And uh, that's really where we're at where we are at with that. Yeah, but Angie's done a nice job really working with Mike and and and, we're, and I think when you see the strategic plan, when it comes to the whole, and I'll send it to all board members if you haven't already. I don't think we've sent it out, no, because we're waiting for this vetting process with the board chairs, but that writing team really worked hard on that this summer. And we've got, based on that portrait, we've now got a strategic plan that's several pages long and it's got I think there are five goals in there with very specific action plans. And uh, I, I think it could guide us for the next at least three to five years, but it could easily be a 10 year map if we do it, if we do it right. Um, and I think it's got a lot of exciting things in there. So Angie, thanks for, for doing that. Stay tuned, it'll be published soon because the first step is to get the SU board to support it and then to, you know, then to start to uh, get the get that plan out to the community the staff. And some of them have seen it. Some of them worked on it. Don't forget, we had that 60 member design team that met all those crazy nights way back when that developed a lot of these ideas and thoughts. So so that was good work. Thank you, Angie and David. Um, I will say that I I've said this before, I'm super excited to where we've gotten with that document. Um, I feel better having read it one time and now we'll go over it again on Wednesday, but I feel better about that document than I ever have about any of our strategic plans because yeah. I couldn't read the other ones. They didn't make any sense to me. The goals were all over the place and weren't in plain English and this feels very good. So I'm, I'm excited to read it again and um, to improve on it if we can and move it forward and actually work from it. Um, so then, does that, anybody else have any questions on portrait? No, okay. Um, moving forward to the anti-racism task force, we met um, last week um, and uh, I am now the chair of the anti-racism task force. Um, <laughs> Colleen's laughing. Oh, <laughs> What is that? Happen? Congratulations, Nikki. I just I just found that out today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, it turns out that when there's radio silence, I can't keep my mouth shut. Um, so, but I'm actually I'm. It, it's such an important thing. I um, didn't feel like radio silence was appropriate, so I took mm -hmm. over. Um, and so um, we didn't. It was really an organizational meeting. We took an hour to decide who was chair. Um, and uh, we also kind of talked through, um, there were some questions um, as to whether or not a policy was the right way to start. Um, and there was a lot of debate on that. That was probably 40 minutes of our discussion. Um, and then there was also a question of whether or not we wanted to continue to call it our anti-racism task force. Um, if we wanted to pick a softer name that might ring better with the community. Um, I don't feel like there was finalization on that, but I, it's still called the Anti-Racism Task Force. Um, and I think my personal opinion is that it should remain that. Um, and I think that's uh, true of most of the group. Yeah. A lot of the group. Yeah. Majority. Um, and um, so the next steps is I emailed um, Writing Wrongs, Ariel and Jameson, um, and I'd like them to um, do, uh, so the first step of the anti-racism task force was that um, we did a question and listening session um, where uh, Jameson asked us some 
pretty tough questions, actually very tough questions. Um, and we responded. Um, and so the next step is that we are going to direct uh, Jameson to ask those tough questions of our administration and some staff members, um, because there were, they're much more in touch with what's happening in the school. Um, the board members kind of know what's happening in the broader community, but we're not drilled down. Um, and thankfully, um, Brittany and Christine don't share every little detail of everything that happens in the school with us. So <laughs> we're gonna let them, um, hopefully Jameson and Ariel will be willing to meet with them um, and do that question and answer session with them. Then the next step will be to um, probably bring it back to the um, board um, member task force to review a draft of a policy that's just a very preliminary draft based on um, those two question and answer sessions. And from there, we'll have to figure out where to go next. Um, I will say that um, Ariel and Jameson asked for a pause um, because they are uh, graduate students and have exams that they need to take. <laughs> so um, they, I emailed them today and said that um, if we get slowed down a little bit, I'm okay with that um, because I think that it's important to do this slowly and right. Um, and so that is where we are with the anti-racism task force. Go ahead, Beth. Yeah, I mean, I would also urge you guys to, you know, zoom, zoom out a little bit and look at board culture because, you know, there's a lot of white supremacy culture just based in our board system and how these things work. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's worth looking at that and how to make our boards as inclusive as possible because it's, if we're making policy, it starts with us. And if we're not an inclusive system, then it's not going to trickle down anywhere. And Nikki, the only question I had too was I did get uh I don't know whether it was requested or not, but I did get that list of people in Windsor who were interested in being on this task force. Did you ask all principals to submit a list of people who would be interested? Um, in no, what I asked, um, so so there's a lot, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, there's, so Ariel and Jameson, for the questioning session, 15 to 20 people is, Match. kind of the best number. Um, and so we did need to keep it small for that. I think for the initial policy discussion, we also need to keep it um, for the initial, just the board members. After that initial, then I think we can open it up. Um, and so what I asked is for each community representative um, on the task force to pick three to four people to, find a way to pick three to four people from their community um, to join us for the next round of opening up. Um, and I guess the way that I kind of envision it is that we'll have those 16 people um, review the policy and then allow the task force to listen in to those 16 people um, so that the task force can absorb how those 16 people react um, and what the conversation is so that we can build on that. That's kind of the vision of what I have. I haven't run that through Ariel and Jameson. Um, and then I think from there, we still need to open it up broader because we can't just show up with this policy that hasn't been vetted well. So um, that's kind of what I see happening right now, but that's my brainstorm. And I'd like to talk to them to figure out um, what they think of that brainstorm and how they would manage it. Yeah. No, they've done this yeah that's right and, and and the other thing i was thinking about um i just want to make sure we're communicating to the to the broader communities both our parent communities and our staff community because i think they all think that there's something starting like in the next couple of days where you know or next week or so where we're going to have a task force i just want to be able to communicate that to them but if those were the names that came based on that request, and I think there were only four or five of them. Then that, then then that's uh, that's great. The other thing I think we have to do, and maybe this is a conversation you could have with Jameson and Ariel, would be 
as we as we embark on this work because it's going to be very delicate work and it's not by the way it's not going to be very easy easy work i think and especially when we get to the wider community and 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 that may be even some of that early debate about what we call the task force buried in that conversation or that question or that debate is a lot of underlying you know sort of baggage that could go along with the word racism or what what is racism but that's that that's that that's not what the point I wanted to make though. What I do think at the onset, both in developing the policy and then coming up with a plan to implement that policy, I mean, I do think it would be good to talk about at some point with the either with that smaller group in terms of what are we, you know, kind of like what are we trying to accomplish if in fact our policy were effective and we were going to create safer spaces for minority communities be they black, brown, or LBGTQ or whatever, what, what would that look like? What, what would need to, what, 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 what would be different, you know, and kind of get some indicators there? Because what I'm worried about is that some place down the line, we've got to figure out a way to measure our progress, right? And, and, and again, I don't think we have to decide this tonight, but I know I've been thinking a lot about this, especially through that equity fellowship that I'm in, and I just happen to be in the middle of it this, this week. And some, some of it is figuring out ways to measure you know what 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 you are trying to accomplish and some of it is pretty it's pretty qualitative and it's not very quantitative but i think if you can get the characteristics down or the attributes of an organization or a community that is welcoming and and and, and is a safe space uh, for our minority communities then i think then we can you know we, there might be a way to measure that christine yeah david did you get four um community members or was it a mix of staff and community members on that list uh i think it was i think it was it looked to me like it was all staff do you yeah. have do you no, have I, no i just think there's a little bit of confusion on the <laughs> committee I, I too. because i think it was my understanding that jameson and ariel were going to do the listening interviews with the administrative team next is that accurate nikki i mean and then so and then, i have staff and then it's the larger community is it is it yeah okay so so um what so the listening tour i think they are only going to do with the task force which has already been done yeah. and then the administration yeah. team yeah. But, and the teachers that come like that, that group um school so, group. so are the so you so the teachers are are doing that with the administrators um and, I, and I'm only I think, asking because I, I don't want there to be anything that gets in the way of honest answers. And I don't know if having administrators with the teachers, if that would happen or not. I mean, I'd like to think it wouldn't, but. Yeah, it could. Right. I, I, I definitely see where you're coming from there. Yeah. Um, and yeah. by the way, just, so, just, go, go ahead, Nikki. Well, I, so I think um, the way that we, I think the way that you communicate going forward is just like let let's just be honest and say that we're on pause for a second. That, I think that's let, good. I let's, think that's great. Let's, Everybody needs to know that. Yeah. Yeah. Let's just let people know that we're working with graduate students who are very bright and are doing the community a service that we're excited about, but they are graduate students and we need to let them do their job, their their other job. Mm -hmm. um, and so that would be the first thing I communicate. Um, just so we're pause and stay tuned. <laughs> we'll let you know you're not excluded and yeah. we'll let you know. And Christine, I think you bring up a really valid point there um, mm -hmm. that I haven't figured out yeah. yet. <laughs> I don't know what to do. No, yeah. that's, a, that's, a, that's a good point. And, and you know, who knows, maybe Colleen, Colleen Deschamps emailed me that list today and I wasn't sure why 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 she was and maybe she was just randomly letting me know who's interested in the building in this topic it might not have been any particular yeah. request i can check in with her you know later on but i think that's a i think that's a good idea that we just let people know because i think even right up last summer uh, you know there was this you know push not push but can, you know uh, a lot of interest in starting a task force like this and then it just sort of, you know, it just leveled. Then we then we were blessed to secure Ariel and and Jameson to do this work. 
by the way, at an incredibly reasonable cost for two bright minds and two people of color to walk us through this. But then, you know, we, 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 we still are on pause. So I think we just need to let people know that we're on pause. Because I know, Christine, you have people in your building that are incredibly passionate yeah. about this. And I wouldn't want them to think that we just, hey, whatever happened to that anti-racism task force? Are they just kind of, you know, I think that would not be a good message to send to our folks. So maybe Angie and, and Katie and Christine, we can think about a way to get something out to the whole staff that just indicates we're on pause. It's still a major priority of our school boards and 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 we'll, and stay tuned. I yeah. think that's all we need to say. I, I think the pause, They I think they said it was a couple of weeks. I don't think it's a, a long pause. It's just a short pause, so. They got to get through exams. It's, yeah, yeah <laughs> it's a short pause. Um, I will admit that I've heard that they picked up more schools, um, I think and they so have. Um, I yeah, and so I I think that the service that they're providing is so needed and um, by everybody that I think everybody's realizing it now. Um, and so I just I guess my personal opinion is that I think <clears throat> I. I very much feel like I need help. I, mm -hmm. as a person of white privilege, I am not the one to be writing an anti-racism policy. And so I, it is my outlook that I will continue to be in touch with them, but I'm also not gonna pressure them to produce something. And I, if they finish some other schools first, I'm totally okay with that as long as, um, you know, we could try to get the attention that I feel like we need. Um, so that's kind of the tack that I want to take because I feel like it's so important. I don't want to rush it. Um, so I will keep in touch. I um, emailed this morning. I haven't heard anything yet. And you know, we'll get something out to the staff just so they know. Yep. It's a work in progress. Yeah. Program. And, and I feel like taking it on. using them is so critical. Um, they really oh, like. Yeah they they could run away right now and do this for the next year and um i feel like we're lucky to have found them i also feel like that their demand is going to be so high i don't know how to manage that and i don't know that they know how to manage that so i'm trying to be sensitive to that yeah so we'll see hopefully go ahead scott yeah thanks i think you you hit on a bunch of things that um were, were questions in my mind since the last supervisory union meeting. But first of all, Beth was talking about um, our board. Evidence of, not our board, I'm sorry, but just evidence of white supremacy on in public, public boards, let's say. Um, and I wouldn't uh, deny that. I just thought that it's, it was encouraging to me, even though it, none of us would have wished to be in uh, in the midst of a coronavirus pandemic. But this this format that we're using now is we've had more folks at school board meetings in the past few months than I can remember ever. I've been doing this with you guys eight and a half years, and it's been a lot of quiet nights. <laughs> and so that that is good. I mean, it's it's. It's a form of equity. I don't know how it addresses the white supremacy part, but I was curious about the um, writing wrongs. Am I correct that it was um, Nikki writing wrongs LLC? Yes, I think it is. Right. Correct. Like, do they have a web presence that that anybody can check out, or you know? They have a national. They have a national. They have a national web presence. National. Yeah. So I think if you if you were to Google them, you'd see something about their. You'll see, you'd see something about them at, at the national level. So Jameson and Ariel are part of a, a much larger organization. Correct. Okay. Oh. I, I did not understand that. Um. So and then that brings us to brings me to the part about um. I was curious whether there were the breadth of the work and whether, you know, if they were both at um, law school in South Royalton, like what part of the state would they do this work in? Just 
on a practical matter. Um, so I don't know how it's blossoming. I hope I wish them all the luck. Um, let's say. Uh, so most of the policies that we that we have approved easily have been uh, looked at by the, uh, the VSBA's team, their internal legal uh, eyes, and then they have uh, external or contract legal help too. So is that something that we should be, um, I don't wonder, it's like as soon as it starts to get it, get pretty big, um, our friends work. Um, are they working with the school boards association or the superintendents association, or is everybody aware of what's what's going on? I think those are really valid questions, and those are thoughts that flew through um, my head as well. Um, I I think. Part of the work is that the policy, um, I mean, yes, we're a small state and, and we could probably draft a policy for the state, but it really, the work needs to happen in the communities, I think. Um, and so while, and this is just where I came to in my own head, being part of this process is that, um, yes, I do think that the state could approach this. Um, I do think that the VSBA could provide guidance on this. But I think that from a community level, we'll get something of more value um, by doing it at the community level. Um, and I think that that's where Jameson and Ariel are um, just so uniquely positioned as two outspoken students of color who are capable of speaking um, to their experience and help those of us who haven't experienced that um, guide us through developing an anti-racism packet, but then also the fact that they can develop a policy because they've got legal background as well. Um, and I think that's just an amazing combination. Um, I think, I worry that they're over-tasked um, and that maybe they need to be at a state level. Um, but that's I think more their decision than ours, and I'm just going to keep trying to hope that we can keep going Thank on our you. process. Yeah, and it is difficult. I, I I just tried googling them again. It's not. There's a trick to how to do this. Elizabeth showed me before to get to the, but 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 I think uh -huh. those are good, those are good questions, Scott. I did writing wrongs anti-racism, and I got it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's the other way, I think seek truth report, writing wrongs programs. Um, yeah. yeah, I know they're they're all over the place. They're not just here. But Scott, to your point, I think that I know the southeast superintendents, and that would be everybody south of basically Hartford. You know, they they're working together. You know, those superintendents to make sure that regionally we have a presence this way too. And I've. I've certainly mentioned that resource to them, whether they'll use them or not. They're all in different places, but but it's but it's a it's, it is a good point. Thank you. Th thanks for taking it on, Nikki. Yeah, I, I think it's important. Um, and like I told the task force, is um, I'm going to delegate, <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to organize these meetings, but I'm not doing all the work. <laughs> um, I. Uh, as you guys know, I'm a little overwhelmed. Um, okay, so that brings us, um, unless anybody has any new business, that um, brings us to uh, setting the agenda and then we will do a short um, executive session, but that is not on this agenda, David. Yeah, I have some new yep. so yeah, you, could, you could still move to go in, even though it's not on the agenda. Okay, Scott, what did you say? New business. Yes. It's totally off the subject that we're on. It's totally off of every other subject that we've been on. That's <laughs> we're on the new business subject. So um, I think this is pointed right at the superintendent. And because Larry's not here, it's not, I wish he was here doing a report. But it kind of ruffles my feathers that you get on the website and then it lists 
schools of WSESU. And we're the, we're the Heartland School District Board. And I can recall, you know, getting letters, letters arriving at the board desk during a meeting that were addressed to the HES board. You know, it's, it's similar. You know, we're, there are, for one thing, there are students who aren't in the district every day. But we're definitely not just a school of WSCSU. You know, our governance is, is, is complete right here. And so it's, um, I just wish, well, I guess I'm being a stinker, but getting some of the basic stuff, the communication and the upkeep of the website, you know, having somebody, having that be a priority over, not over, but as well as coronavirus pandemic response. Mm. Please. Yeah, I know we, you know, we have, a, and Larry would be probably the better person to address this. And we, we do have a webmaster. It happens to be Larry's brother, Ryan. Um, and, and, and the way that website gets updated is with the information that's sent to Ryan. Now, the apps, the actual organization of the website, I think that would be a bigger conversation that we'd have with Larry, whether or not it should be schools or school districts, you know, uh, I mean, I'm not saying that's what you're proposing, but I mean, I think that would be a, a bigger question, but I think it's a valid question and we could, I know Larry's going to be giving a report at the November meeting to the entire SU board, first of all, about his budget, but just like, you know, how he does that little annual update. So that might be a time too. I'm not trying to slough it off tonight, but to bring that up again, Scott, and we can, you know, we yeah. can talk more, more okay. specifically about what that looks like. I mean, just to be clear, we're not, we're not a unified district as much as I've spoken about that and how it, in some ways the governance structure of a unified district would be different has is different and would have a lot of pluses in my mind but we're just not there so mm -hmm. it makes it look like that and part of that quite frankly is a little bit intentional but but i know what you mean i, I get it i guess i have a little thing on that too is um the lunch menus are not updated very quickly um what do they do they come out by the month yeah they come out by the month but i remember like i don't know it was like the seventh or eighth and i went to the website and it was still september so that's an easy one to fix well yeah I think it's an easy one to fix but but and I don't know if it's just an oversight i mean like I don't know what the structure of the website, if it has to be updated in four different locations. Uh, no, no. And, and I'm and not really is, complaining about it, but while we're on the subject, I'm no, just that's, No, that's right. <laughs> and there's an example where that would be, you know, that's not a, a, a Ryan Dower problem. That That's probably a Craig Locarno problem. He's got to get that to Ryan in a timely fashion so that yeah. it can get posted to the website. So, but that, I'll, I'll, I'll certainly, I, I mean, I can, I can, that one might be easy to fix. We had a problem two weeks ago where we weren't getting the board minutes and the board agendas, you know, because as soon as it goes out to all of you, and it sounds like it may, might not have even gone out to all of us this time. I don't know. I mean, Lori's really, it's a work in progress. She's getting there, I think. And she's incredibly efficient, uh, Lori Brown. She'll get this down pat. Um, but uh, she admittedly, she said, I made a mistake. I didn't. This was on a Weathersfield meeting. It, it sat, you know, that was probably the worst bo board to, you know, to make that mistake. But we didn't get it to the website in time. But Lori apologized. You know, she apologized, and she said, "I'll make sure that happens." And I went to the website tonight, and all of our stuff, you know, the, the minutes were there, the agenda was there. I mean, I don't know how many people go to the website, but I know Lori's trying to keep that up to up to date. But the website's always an ongoing kind of issue, but it's, you know, and we, yeah, but point well taken, we'll stay on it. Did Where did you go, Nikki? Did you go to the WSESU or to the Heartland? Um, for the lunch menu? Yeah. I was going to the Heartland. Sorry, somebody needed a hug. 
Um, I was going to that one. It, it's, I think it's there this week because I did print it, I think. I bet it's, I bet it's there now, but but it should yeah. be there by the first of the month. It should be, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Be. I'll follow yeah, up. It was, it was late. Um, Food service, is, that's what it's under. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, um, it's, it's there now. It should be. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but, and I'm not like, I don't want to be yeah. whining or anything. Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> um, but well, it, I, I, I do. It's now, yeah. I mainly think because of there, there have been parents that um well people check it yeah people check it and especially kids with food allergies and that's the one that I worry about most is that right. you know, some parents would choose to pack lunch based on what's right. in right. here um, yeah okay so um any other new business or are we doing okay okay um so for setting the next agenda um I think we'll stick I think that this agenda is pretty spot on. Is there anything that people want to add to this agenda that no. I would keep everything and I do principal's reports, superintendent's report, COVID, but budget. I think she broke it. Portrait. Yeah. And then the Yeah. I just. Oh, I froze. Yes, I over, just say yeah. yes. I froze. Okay. Maybe you can hear me now that I turn my video off. Now we can. Okay. Um, so I would stick with the exact same um, items for discussion, the exact same agenda. Um, is there anything? Did I miss anything that people feel like we need to discuss? Those are our priorities, I think. Okay. Um, David, these are minor things, but um, I did want to keep the radar list on the agendas. It you got dropped off of this one. Um, yeah. Again, no fault. I just, we went through all the work to get it put together. I want to keep it on there because I, yeah. it actually is something that I review before every meeting and I missed mm -hmm. yeah. it um, today. And then we should also keep the tentative uh, executive session on there. I think that also dropped off. But the good news is, is that we got the principal's report and the superintendent's report back. I'm happy. <laughs> um, okay. I think we need a short executive session. Um, I'm going to give some hugs um, <laughs> to my family. This will be do quick. We need a one to two minute break, or are um, we ready to dive through and power through? I think we're this big, all What'd you say, Christine? I, I didn't say anything. Okay. Sorry. I don't, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> Just give me a thumbs up if you want to power through or a thumbs down if you need a break. I think we can power through and be done in 10 minutes. If okay, that. awesome. Let's power through. Okay, I'm going to give a quick hug up. Okay, I think we can stop. Uh, no, we need a, uh, I need a motion to move into executive session. A motion to go in executive session. That's that. Yeah. Beth Roy, yep. Second. 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 Okay. It's 843. Angie. Okay, all those in favor of moving to executive session, say aye. 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 All those opposed, OK. 